This is a show about the ferocious pursuit of incremental growth from the inside out. And it's also a show about whatever else I feel like talking about, no matter how random, irrelevant, or confusing the subject might be. You are listening to the Emotionally Excellent Man Show, and I'm your host, Jason McKenzie. All right, before we saddle up, I want to tell you about the Dad Edge Alliance, which is my absolute favorite community on the whole entire internet. It's a group of, at the time of this, my recording, it's about 250 guys. It's growing all the time, but it is a community unlike anything I've ever seen. And I don't know if you could hear that thunder that just happened, but that is a sign that what I'm saying is truly, truly important. That's right. Thunder. Thunder happened when I'm talking about the Dad Edge Alliance. So listen, if you're a guy and you are feeling like your friendships, your relationships are superficial, you get around, you shoot the shit, but you're never going deeper. You don't feel safe to do that. um, And you know that there's something more. I'm telling you, join this community. It is insanely life-changing. Okay. Like we got guys in there from all walks of life. And, but they all have one thing in common. They're trying to elevate fatherhood by improving themselves. They're leaning in. They're supporting each other. They're learning from one another. They're learning about themselves. They're challenging themselves. They're setting goals. They're holding each other accountable, but they are all doing it in a place that's totally safe and totally just overflowing with bro love. And I'm trying to say that in a manly way, bro love, right? So, you know, One of the things that I've learned throughout my own personal development journey, which is a journey that will last the rest of my life, obviously, is that the people you surround yourself with are that like, that's one of the most important choices you can make. Many of you have probably heard the quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And when I first heard that, like logically, I got it like, okay, that makes sense. But I never could have imagined what it actually meant, how transformative it is to get a better, higher caliber, more open, loving, caring, relentless group of men in your life. So that's what this fucking community provides. I mean, I can't, I don't know how to state it in a way that really truly conveys how I feel about it. Like, maybe I'll just say fuck a lot more. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, the stuff that goes on here is crazy. It's, they've got community calls, they've got you know, accountability teams. They've got amazing content, free books. We're building courses. Um, we have experts come in, New York Times bestselling authors, Navy SEALs to speak to the guys. And the guys are learning and they're growing and they're building relationships with one another and they're bringing a better version of themselves into every, into every aspect of their life. So please uh, think about it. Look around you. Do you have the group of people around you that are going to help you create the fucking life you want? Most people don't. Most people don't even know there's an alternative. And most people don't even understand how important it is. So I'm telling you from my own personal experience and witnessing hundreds of people have the same experience, it changes everything. Okay, so listen, if you want to know more, you can either always send me a message or you can go to gooddadproject.com slash alliance and I'll keep the, I'll put that link in the show notes page. Do it and it will help you become emotionally fucking excellent. Now on to the show. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Emotionally Fucking Excellent Man Show. And on the show today, I've got Antoine Horde, who's got an amazing, amazing story. He uh, he actually reached out to me on uh, Facebook, and we got chatting about how we can make a con, you know, about making a contribution in the mental health space, and it got led to us having a phenomenal conversation. Uh, and he is such an interesting guy. Basically, went from the uh, inner city to the uh, to becoming a professional basketball player, and uh, really dealing with uh, you know. Having a pretty challenging upbringing, um, which I feel like is, you know, with my limited experience, obviously, which is all secondhand. But I mean, I think there's a lot of kids who grew up in that environment that have uh, some pretty serious challenges with, you know, probably absent fathers for all kinds of different reasons. And, you know, culture of, I mean, the libertarian in me is just going to say it's fucking the drug war uh, more than anything else. But regardless, be that as it may, Antoine you know, came through that crucible and, uh, 
went on to become a professional basketball player and uh, just got such an amazing way of looking at the story. In fact, we ended up talking for so long on the podcast that uh, we didn't even actually get to the part where he talks about his own journey with, um, you know, basically his, say, journey of emotional excellence. Like we we didn't quite get to that part, so we're actually going to record a second a uh, second part of the episode, which actually I'm going to record next week. He doesn't know that yet, but I'm going to email him and set it up for next week. But uh, what a fascinating story. I mean, he's got some really uh, crazy situations that happened to him from being robbed at gunpoint the day before and having his grandmother's money stolen before, the day before he went to college to, uh, you know, being a tall freaking black guy in Finland playing professional basketball. Like it's it's a, an awesome story. And he's got a really wonderful perspective about it. And he's, you know, vastly changed his life, even since uh, he retired being a professional basketball player. And when he, he's just one of those guys that when you talk to, you just get such a great vibe off him. And uh, like I said, I really enjoyed it so much that uh, I couldn't actually stop talking with him. So we had to cut it short and uh, promise to record number two. So without any further ado, I will say enjoy this conversation with my new friend Antoine Horde, and we will see you on the other side, and also see you soon on the other side of uh, the beginning and other side of part two of this amazing story. Enjoy. Hey, Antoine, and welcome to the show, man. All right, thank you, thank you for having me. Is this your first? Is this your first time you're doing a podcast interview? First time doing a podcast. Uh, podcast didn't exist during my basketball plan day, so this is actually my first podcast. I've done plenty of interviews. And TV appearances, but never a podcast. So this is the first one for me. All right, right on. Well, so we met uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, maybe about three weeks ago, and you reached out to me, yep. and uh, you were really interested in doing something to help out mental health warriors. And I was walking home from work, and we had this conversation that I really love. So, um, I guess, what are you doing right now? And what was the maybe give give the audience a uh, maybe a recap or what what caused you to reach out to me in the first place? Okay, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former professional basketball player turned graphic designer. So uh, to answer your question today, I, you know, I work, I work as a freelance graphic designer. So, uh, you know, I've always wanted to try to reach back and kind of, I don't know, do something to help out in terms of, you know, the whole uh, me- mental health issue. So I just happened to be, um, you know, trying to create some T-shirts and stuff one day online. And, uh, you know, I had this idea that popped into my head to do some, you know, because I, I was watching the playoffs. This is how the idea came about. I was watching Golden State play, and so I thought about the Golden State Warriors. And since I had mental health on my mind at the time, I was thinking about, okay, wow, what a, it'll be real cool to do some T-shirts that says, uh, you know, mental health warriors. So I came up with this whole idea, the whole concept. So I tried to do a logo that kind of emulated the Golden State logo, except it had like kind of a, I don't know, a Spartans mask on there and, uh, you know, the, the, the mental health month colors, the green, and, and, and I added some gold, like Golden State. So I came up with this logo. And so, I, you know, I, I like to work ethically. So I went online to check and see if anybody was using the name. You know, a lot of people, they just go and do whatever. They don't really care, you know, in, in terms of, you know, image rights and stuff like that. So I decided to go online and see if anybody was, uh, you know, using the name Mental Health Warriors for, for any, you know, uh, graphic t-shirts or you know if it was the actual business or whatever whatever and it so happens that i ran across your website you know on, on mental and it was actually named mental health warriors so i was a bit discouraged at first you know because i really wanted to do the shirts and put them out there uh, but then i said no you know antoine get out of your you know the the old monkey mind and, and and really really transform your new self and just you know it could probably go well just reach out to whoever it is that has a website and who knows, you may be able to do a collab or something like that. You never know. And your ideas still may come to fruition. So I went and, and checked out your website, saw some of the info, information, you know, briefly went through the site and, you know, read, read up a little bit on, you know, what you've been doing and stuff like that. So that's when I decided to contact you. When I saw the Facebook link, I decided to contact you on Facebook. And that's that's kind of how the, the whole idea about me contacting you came, came about. Ah, right, cool. That's awesome. So, and uh, I love the fact that you got through your initial discouragement and uh, I like that you called yeah. that out and that, that was an intentional action. Is that, I mean, I guess one, well, actually one thing I'm wondering is where, where are the golden state warriors located? Are they in California somewhere? Is that the golden? Yeah. State? Yeah. They, they're in the Bay area out in Cali. So they out there. Hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> now when we talked on the phone, uh, you had told me a little bit about, uh, you know, 
some mental health issues and stuff. So I, I don't know, why don't you take us back to your, maybe your background and let us know, I don't know, how, how you grew up, what your family situation was like, what your, you know, what your upbringing was like. I'd love to hear how that contributed, not only to the, some of the struggles that you had, but how, you know, to the man you are today. Okay, well, okay, I, I, I suppose I'd say it was a kind of a mixed bag, uh, you know, for me growing up, because it wasn't always all bad times. And I guess that's kind of, how you can kind of get sucked into the vacuum of, of things seeming to be normal when they're not. Uh, you know, I grew up with my grandma, my brother and I, and, and my younger sister who was born, you know, when I was 16 years old, she was born. But anyway, I grew up most of my, uh, my, my younger years with my brother and my grandma. And I stayed with my grandma, my grandfather my, and my grandfather. And, um, you know, it was cool. You know, we lived in a nice neighborhood and stuff when I was a kid and all, and, you know, other families were there in the neighborhood, you know, everyone, took good care of the houses, their homes, their lawns. It was working class people and stuff like that. So I had a pretty good upbringing in terms of environment. It wasn't all bad. You know, even though I grew up in Chicago, I actually lived in a neighborhood that was pretty, pretty cool at the time. So uh, that was never an issue. You know, my grandfather was a hardworking man, you know, worked for Ford Motor Company. And my grandma, she didn't do much. She was, she was the one that kind of brought in the, uh, the, the really hard memories for me and stuff as a kid or whatever. But she, you know, she was there. She took care of me and my brother my sister and stuff, you know, albeit as a tyrant, she did it that way. But, um, you know, I grew up in uh, inner city Chicago. And, hey, you know, I spent you, hey, sorry, where were your parents? Um, my mom, okay, I was going to get to that, but, oh, um, sure, anyways, sure, sure. Was, okay. no, 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 since, since you asked, Jason, I'm, I'm going to get right to it. Um, my mom, she had me when she was 14. All right. So there lies the, the first nugget of, uh, I won't say dysfunctionality, but, uh, I'd say conflict, <laughs> I'd say between her and my grandma. Uh, you know, no mother wants to see their daughter, um, you know, birth a kid at, uh, you know, 14 years old, but it happened or whatever. And so, you know, my grandma, because my mom was a minor and she was underage, she had to finish school or whatever. And, uh, my grand, my grandma, she ended up uh, taking custody of me and my brother. And so we ended up living with her and uh, my mom was able to finish high school and right after high school, because she had, you know, young, young kids, she had my, also had my brother at 16 years old. So she had two kids by the age of 16, which Holy. is like. Yeah, like <laughs> totally out there. Um, God, my anyway, daughter's my daughter's fourteen, man. That is just almost yeah. Like you can't even fathom that, right? Right. Exactly. I got a daughter that's going to be fourteen in like a couple of months here, so that's just like totally out there. So you can imagine the disappointment from you know my mom's mother, my grandma, and uh, you know just the kind of the whole family uh, kind of got all those eyes looking on you as a fourteen year old kid, you know, with a with, with already with a baby. So you know that was tough for my mom. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh. My grandma ended up taking me and my brother in and my mom, she finished high school and, and, and started working right away, like right after high school. So yeah, that was that part. And then, like I said, my, my growing up was kind of bittersweet because we end up staying with my grandma, uh, with my grandma and my grandfather. And, you know, that was cool. Cause like I said, they take, they took really good care of us. But at the same time, my grandma, she had, you know, she had issues of her own cause this is a woman from the streets, you know, in and out of jail, stuff like that. She prostituted her body. You know, she used drugs. She sold drugs like that whole uh, inner city stuff that you hear about, you know, all the the, the, the rumors and, uh, and the stereotypes of Chicago. Well, it, it actually happened like in my family and my grandma was uh, very much embedded in that type of lifestyle. So she brought that into her marriage. She brought that into her relationships and the family. And she just had this kind of a, a hustle mentality when it came to dealing with people and stuff like that. So um, she was very, very, very hard on my brother and I. You know, she did some really mean and horrible things to us. You know, uh, she 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 verbally abused us, physically abused us, and it was it was awful. And um, yeah, I actually, you know, despite the fact that my mom uh, birthed us at you know such a young age, I actually would wish I, you know, looking back, I wish I had had an opportunity to grow up with my with my with my, my mother. Wow, that's uh, that's an incredible story. So it's interesting that your your grandmother, I mean, from that background and the way she acted, but it sounds like your grandfather was a I mean, did he grow up uh, like on the, I guess, in inner city Chicago? Because it sounds like he was working a pretty normal blue collar job. Like it's it's interesting that maybe it's two people of those backgrounds kind of paired up. Well, you know, the thing with my grandfather, he brought the stability in the family because he was the breadwinner. So he was making the money, you know, and during those times, you know, the women were at home working, taking care of the kids, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the, the man was out there working and, 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 you know, bringing home the money and putting food on the table. So that's pretty much was my grandfather's role. During that time, and he worked at Ford, Ford Motor Company, uh, I think for like 30 years or something like that, man. So he was, you know, he was really a tenured guy over there and, uh, you know, he made really good money and stuff. And, 
he was the kind of hard working man that I got to see every day go to work. But, but you know, he, he worked like 18 hour days, which was totally crazy. The only, only times he got off was on the weekends and he would come home on the weekend. And, uh, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but he had a really, really, really bad drinking problem. You know, mm. I didn't think much of it as a young kid, but, you know, we would watch football games together and stuff on Sundays on the weekends with my grandfather. And he'd sit there in his chair and he wouldn't move all day. He'd have a, a fifth of Bacardi rum bottle sitting right there on his, 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 t- his end table next to his chair. And he'd have his glass and his cup and he'd sit there and watch football games all day, you know, just downing him, dro- dousing himself with Bacardi rum like all day. And he would just stink of liquor and stuff all day, you know, but he was a really nice man and stuff. But, you know, as a, as a young kid, you don't realize that, you know, it's something wrong, something's wrong with this guy. Like he has a, he has a, a problem, like something's wrong here. You know, it's not normal to just be sitting there dousing. And I'm not talking, talking about a look, a little bit of liquor. I'm talking about a fifth of, of Bacardi, man. And he's, he's finishing like the whole bottle, man. So I kind of grew up as that being this habitual thing on the weekends where I would watch football games and stuff with my grandfather and watch him just sit there and just, you know, dowsing himself in liquor, you know, and I didn't realize how much, um, you know, him and my grandma, they really didn't get along well. They found a way to make it work, but they argued all the time. They argued in front of us, you know, arguing, cussing, fighting and stuff. So, you know, my childhood, I saw a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't have seen. But at the time, like I said, it, it all appeared to be normal at the time. It's interesting because my, it sounds so, I mean, maybe not to that extreme, but it sounds a lot like my, uh, my grandparents. So they lived in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my, they were Canadian and my grandmother was from Northern Quebec. Uh, right. like, so basically she grew up, I mean, she was born in 1920, I think, you know, she was freaking dirt poor in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Northern Canada. And, and my, my grandfather was a tool and die maker, worked for, uh, worked for General Motors for a long, long time, total workaholic. You know, uh-huh. he didn't really have a drinking problem, but yeah, yeah. my grandmother had a lot of, uh, you know, in issues with she, she was, I think she had a grade four education. So I'm sure there was issues of, you know, deep issues of insecurity there. And mm-hmm. I mean, just, just had a shitty upbringing, right? You know, her mom right. died when she was young. And, yeah. and, uh, so she used to, you know, she was always nice to us as grandkids, actually, because we didn't, we didn't live with her or anything, but we, we would yeah. visit her a few times a year. But man, she could be nasty to my parents and to my, yeah. I mean, that, not to my dad, but to, yeah. to my mom, who was her daughter. And, uh, just a lot of, uh, anger and drinking and, um, so, anyways, I can just it's it was funny. It sounded uh, there's some definite similarities there. I wonder how common that kind of thing was at the in in that generation. Who knows? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You know, it's I can totally relate. <laughs> hmm. So yeah. So anyways, you're uh, you're talking about growing up there. So so I mean, did you ever end up living with your with your mom? And I'm assuming your dad was not in the picture at all. Well, he was he was around, and that's the thing about my okay. mom and dad. You know, even though they had us at a very young age, you know, they loved each other, so they were together. You know, they weren't married when they had me at the time, obviously <laughs> being so young or whatever. But they eventually get went on and got married, and uh, they lived together. Whatever they worked, they both worked. You know, they always kept jobs and stuff like that. Um, we continued to stay with my grandma because, like I said, my grandma had custody of us. And then when my mom and dad eventually wanted to get custody of us, my grandmother she wouldn't relinquish the custody. So there mm. goes another conflict in there. And, and my dad had, you know, like extreme resentment towards my grandma from that period on. And, uh, you know, the only time we would see them were on weekends, you know, like uh, during the week when they worked and stuff, we couldn't go see them because we were in school. They would work, obviously. But on the weekends, you know, my grandma would take us or either my dad would come and pick us up from my grandma's house and uh, take us to live with them um, on the weekends. So we would see them, uh, you know, for the weekends. Wow, that must have been... Like when she got custody, was it, was it, uh, temporary? Like, was it full, like temporary or did your parents actually have to, until your parents were of age or whatever? Or was it? No, she like- outright adopted us. So, you know, oh, my okay. grandma, she adopted, adopted us. My, my mom agreed to it because they had a re- kind of relationship where, you know, my grandma just kind of bullied my mom around. She was a really nice woman, sweet and all, but, um, she didn't have a really strong character in terms of, uh, you know, resisting people and, 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 and going against things that she didn't like and stuff like that. She can kind of be bullied, uh, mm. so to speak. And uh, so she let my, my grandma re- manipulate her, uh, you know, with the whole custody battle thing. And so we end up, you know, growing up and, and living uh, with my grandma. So oh, it's interesting. Yeah. So, hey, one thing I'm curious about, and I mean, I know you said your grandmother came from inner city Chicago. I mean, what is your take on... As, you know, a Canadian dude who's had a, a pretty, you know, 
like uh, the first world life, I would say. I mean, what, you know, I look at the, what happens in, in say the inner city in the United States. And I mean, there's such a part of me that blames, I mean, I'm sure it's a, such a complicated multifaceted situation, but I mean, I'm sure a big part of it is the war on drugs. And I, I mean, there's a million factors, but what, I mean, what is your, what do you, what do you think about that? Like, why, why is it like that? Where it's just like, I mean, I look at, I watch TV and I, you know, I see videos of like Flint, Michigan and stuff like that. Like, how does, how does it end up like that? And how do, I, I mean, that's such a stupid question for such a complicated issue. I just don't understand it at all. And I would really like to get some more insight on it. I mean, for me, I mean, personally, I think a lot of this starts in the mind. Like <laughs> everything on the external starts with the internal for me. So I don't know, a lot of the inst- institutionalized th- way of thinking and, you know, uh, some of the stereotypes and stuff in society in America, stuff like that, that kind of, I don't know, it kind of breeds uh, certain behaviors and stuff, you know, in the communities mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, you kind of get, uh, even though it, it may not be a uh, literal truth, but you kind of feel boxed in, even though that may not be the truth, you know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, especially for someone growing up in the inner city, you might feel like there's no way out. And, you know, you, uh, you know, when you grow up around people, um, telling you, you know, you can only do this, you know, you have certain limits on your life, blah, 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 and all that stuff. Those stereotypes start to begin to manifest manifest themselves in an external world, you know, and, you know, in terms of the violence and the killing and stuff like that, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a stereotypical thing where, you know, you have to always fend for yourself and protect yourself and, you know, survival of the fittest mentality and stuff like that. And it just, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing that, you know, if you don't deal with the mind, then you know people start to live and 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 think and live these things like externally. So I don't know. For me, everything starts with the internal mind, and 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 it, it extends out from there. That's so interesting. So I mean, so you know, talking about your grandmother and her being mean to you and stuff. Like, what kind of impact is that having on you as a young person? Like, I mean, what kind of? I mean, it must be. It must be impacting your your sense of self worth. I mean, what a, like tell me about that. What that was like for you as as far as how it how you looked at yourself or how you coped with it. Okay, well, you know, as kids, as most most kids are, you know, we like to, you know, we curious, we like to play, we like to have fun, and you just want to be a kid, right? You don't want to have any limitations set on yourself, you know, in terms of what you can and cannot do and stuff. And my grandmother was such a tyrant, you know, she had such a a hard life herself that. Somehow, somewhere along the lines, like religion kind of got in the way for her because she, she goes from this really street, uh, streetwise woman to someone who's put in a position to have to now be nurturing. And it just wasn't her normal thing. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. you know, she tried at times and stuff, but it was always it was never genuine. You know, it was always because she wanted some or she, she needed some type of credit or validation or whatever for, for her own insecurities and stuff. Uh, but maybe because she felt bad about her life and stuff like that. So she tried to be really religious and, you know, she got the Jesus photo on the mirror and, you know, the Bibles all stacked up, uh, you know, on the desk next to her bed. And, you know, we prayed at night together with her and stuff like that, you know, you know, but, you know, throughout the day and throughout our lives and stuff, you know, you can be a, a MF or a SOB or whatever, you know, at the drop of a dime, you know, she'd call us names and say, Oh, you guys ain't going to be shit in life. And, you know, you're going to have your women taking care of you. Your mom didn't want you. That's why she, you know, she she didn't take care of you growing up. And like, it was just this whole negative vibe, you know. And every time my brother and I tried to, I don't know, do anything to just have fun and just be kids, she would find a way to to just, I don't know, put out the fire, just, just exterminate everything that we would try to do. And so, you, you know, you get frustrated as a kid and you feel this anger and stuff that starts to build up inside you and this rage because you despise this person that's, you know, been put in charge of taking care of your life and they're not nurturing. They don't take care of you. They, they're not sensitive. They don't have a loving, caring heart. So you don't, you grow up not knowing what love feels like or looks like, you know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. you try to emulate, you know, what you see on TV or what you may think is love, or, you know, you try to seek it in other areas of your life, uh, whether it be women or drinking or, or what have you, you know what, you know what I mean? Just to try to find some s- sense of some feeling of, of feel good, you know? And my grandma was such a tyrant, man. Like, ah, I mean, she called me some names. I don't, I don't know if I can curse on a podcast, but I can Fuck tell you, do man, it, like, man. Yeah, she's like, "You motherfuckers ain't gonna be shit, and you niggers this, and you niggers that." And you know, I heard the N word so much growing up in my in, in my youth that I just thought that was normal, you know. And you you hear that a lot 
and the communities where I'm from, you know, the dark skinned people, brown skinned people, you know, it's it's a common thing, but it's not that common. And, and like I said, you know, <clears throat> earlier in the podcast, it's like, you know, you grow up in an environment where abnormal things seem to be uh, normal. You know, like my grandfather drinking like that was not a normal thing, but it became normal for me. You know, my, my grandma speaking to me that way and cursing me out and, and calling me names and stuff like that and telling me I, I wasn't going to be anything in life, that became a normal thing. You know, so you pick up all those habits as a youth and you don't realize how much, you know, those things stay with you and stick with you into your out into your adulthood. And once you get outside the neighborhood, once you get into professional environments, once you get into, you know, uh, uh, college or, you know, high school or whatever, and you start to get outside of your house and you have to deal with other people where well, you still carrying on to that stuff. You know what I mean? So, um, mm-hmm. it built up a lot of anger in me. I, I, I say that much. <laughs> so yeah, no kidding. So when you, you know, when you talked about that, you were kind of reflecting on it, I guess, from the perspective of you, you as a, the man that you are right now, you know, understanding that you're, you know, looking for love and all that. But I mean, as a kid, I, I doubt you were out really, I mean, you're a kid, right? I mean, you're a young person. I remember what an idiot I was when I was <laughs> basically all the way up to 35 for crying out loud. But I mean, so what, I mean, so you, I'm sure you didn't have that level of insight into your own feelings at that time. So what were you thinking? Were you just, just angry? You know, and I, then- mean, I was angry. I, I, I became very insecure. You know, I lost confidence in myself. You know, I was an artist and I was, I became a really shy kid. I, you know, I started off trying to be outgoing and stuff like most kids do, but you know, you taught to hold those things in and, 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 you know, you, 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 you're taught to, to be a certain way around certain people and stuff like that. So I, I, I became, you know, kind of secluded, you know, I, I isolated myself around from around people and stuff like that because, you know, you don't want to be hurt. You know, now you got this, you know, this fear inside of you of, 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 of wanting to not be hurt again, you know, because that's what you live every day of your life, you know. So I became a really shy kid. I was awkward with girls and stuff like that. So, you know, eventually I got into sports and stuff like that, you know, but my personality uh, totally changed from when I was, I'll say, eight, nine years old or whatever, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old on. You know, I became a real shy guy. I was stuck to myself. I had friends and stuff in the neighborhood or whatever. But like when I went to high school and even grade school, I can remember, man, like I had a few buddies and stuff like that. But like, you know, they were the real cool ones or whatever, or what people would consider cool at the time anyway. And I was the shy guy, you know, not, you know, into the, all the wild stuff and crazy stuff or whatever, because, you know, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I withdrew, you know, you know, mm. from having this type of ver- ver- uh, verbal and physical abuse from your grandma, it just makes you a certain way, man. And, um, like I said, that, uh, childhood uh, experience is kind of what led me into my young adulthood and eventual adult life, you know, with those same feelings inside, you know what I mean? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I mean, I, that's I see this all the time with people. Is you know, and I often wonder, even for my own childhood. I mean, I, again, it was it was fine, but I, I mean, I know there's things in, that happened. It just just our we we are the we are the culmination of all our experiences, right? So I often sometimes wonder if anything that happened to me, um, you know, it, it, how it how it impacts me today. I really have no idea. It's something I should probably do some navel gazing on. But um, so you. So, you know, you've withdrawn. And I mean, how did you end up getting into sports? Because sports is, I mean, it's just team activity. Um, you know, at this point, you're not believing in yourself. Like, how did how did that happen? What gave you the courage or the interest to to take that kind of step? And I mean, um, were you, I mean, were you scared shitless? Was it a result of you being, you know, not seeing any other way to spend your time? Like, what was, how did that Pan out, I, well, guess. I was I was I was kind of forced into that too because uh, my mm. grandma she controls every aspects of our lives. She never asked us our interests, or what we like to do, or want to do, or stuff like that. So so you know she would put us in act- different activities and stuff like that. Because like I said, uh, you know, growing up, Chicago is a really dangerous city, and you know, uh, you know, as a grandma, even someone as mean as she could be, you know, she didn't she 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 wouldn't want to see any harm come to us. So you know, she put us in sports to keep us off the streets because basically you know if you don't have anything to do with your life in chicago you know you can dabble into all kind of shit you know what i mean so um she she put us in karate you know we tried karate for a time or whatever i did freaking square dancing i hated it like i hated oh it no she- square <laughs> dancing yeah square dancing man. So, so I, didn't like- picture, I didn't picture like <laughs> where you lived in chicago being like a hub of square dancing man <laughs> yeah so she would take us to like the local rec center man we had square dancing lessons I mean, I did bowling, man, and then eventually she got us into sports. I played baseball as a youth. You know, when I was 10 years old, I started playing baseball. 
And um, when I was 11 years old, I met my grade school buddy and he wanted me to come out for the basketball team. And his mom called my grandma, you know, because we were real close friends and stuff like that. His mom called my grandma and asked her, you know, um, would I you know, be interested in playing basketball? And so my grandma would sign me up for the basketball team, you know, in grade school. And I eventually, uh, you know, get really, really interested in basketball. So that's how that all began. But it was uh, originally it was just uh, a way to keep me and my brother off the streets, you know, because, like I said, Chicago such a dangerous city and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, activities is what <clears throat> keeps you busy and keeps you away from all the riffraff. Uh, you know, I remember bowling when I was a kid. I was in a bowling league, and yeah, you, you had these ridiculous shirts on, and and like <laughs> yeah, it was like a bowling league shirt. And then what they would do is, it, whatever you did something good, it was kind of like scouts. You'd get like this patch you could stow on it. Like so, if you got like bowled over two hundred or whatever, you get this patch. And there were some people that had they were really good, and they had patches all over their shirts. Yeah, exactly. I was so bad, man. My shirt was basically it was just a dorky shirt with no patches on it. I was such a I was so bad. <laughs> yeah, I remember those times a lot. I remember that. Yeah, I do. Oh, so, so when you got into when you got into basketball, how old how old were you at the time? Uh, the first time I picked up a basketball and started playing was when I was eleven years old. I was I, I fell in love with baseball. Like baseball was really my thing. Like I, like I said, I was a shy kid, so I really didn't want to do it because I didn't want to be around other people. I, w- I, I didn't want to be around. Uh, you know, I didn't want to. F- I had to fail failure and stuff like that. So I didn't want to be bad at it and stuff like that. So I really didn't want to do it. You know, my grandma made us do it. We eventually started playing baseball. And once I got into it, I loved it. You know what I mean? It it, it got me away from her. It got me doing activities. It got me being a kid again, you know, having fun, you know, playing, you know, seeing my buddies, you know, uh, you know, growing friendships and stuff like that. You know, I eventually got good at it, you know, made all star teams and stuff like that. So, you know, that gives you confidence as a kid, you know, and it, and it was fun. You know, it was something fun to do. I got a chance to travel a little bit in the area, even though it was, you know, just in the surrounding Chicago area. But I got to travel a little bit. And like I said, play a, a little little bit in uh, some of the all-star games in the area and stuff like that. So baseball was my first love. That, that was really fun. Um, but like I said, when I turned 11, I did baseball for a couple of years. And when I turned 11, uh, you know, I started playing basketball. And originally I wasn't really good at it. But I did like it, you know, and I was having fun playing and all, you know, I just was frustrated because I wasn't really that good. I like to shoot a lot, but I didn't make many damn shots. You know what I mean? So, you know, it didn't start off great for me, but over the years and stuff, you know, year by year, you know, I started taking it a little bit more seriously and stuff like that. And it got to a point where I started liking basketball even more than baseball. So I think I, around the time I was what 13, 30, yeah, I'd say like 13 years old. I had totally given up on baseball and just wanted to. I, I put all my energy into basketball from that from that point on. Do you remember how you, in your mind at the time? So you know, you, you mentioned that you have this, like you know, your grandma's basically berating you all the time, and, you, and you've withdrawn, and your self confidence is low. How do you reconcile that in your own head as a young person who, who's also? I mean, so on one hand, you're thinking you're feeling like shit about yourself. And on the other hand, you're excelling at baseball. Like, how did you think about that at the time? Like, did that help you? I'm sure it gave you confidence. But was there, I mean, were there parts of you thinking that I don't belong to be doing this? I'm not good enough. Like, did you have any of that kind of stuff going on? Yeah, you have some doubts, you know, especially, you know, during the times when you don't play well or you go through a little adversity and stuff like that, you you have a lot of self-doubt and stuff like that. You can't go home and get any encouragement or something like that from your mom or your dad. You know, it was my grandma. Like I say, my grandfather was working 18 hours a day. So he was never really around just on the weekends and stuff like that. So, you know, if there was going to be any encouragement or someone there to help lift you up or build you up, you know, it definitely wasn't coming from my grandma. So that that was one of those feelings where you feel kind of helpless as a kid because you, you left to figure out a lot of things that, you know, you shouldn't have to at, at that age. You know what I mean? You're talking about between 10 to 12, 13 years old. And, um, you know, so it was a lot of days where I felt empty inside, where I felt like I couldn't reach out uh, to any adults in my life because my mom wasn't around. My grandma was not somebody I can confide in, you know. And so I, I was left to kind of fend for myself at a very, very young age. And um, that was tough. That was tough because you feel helpless. You feel lonely. You feel all those feelings of isolation and stuff like that. And uh, that that just wasn't cool at all. So, you know, I struggled with that early on. And again, you know, I had these waves of, you know, moments where I have, you know, extreme confidence when I was doing well. But any type of bumps on the road and stuff like that, it it made me go into a shell where, you know, I just would want to hide myself, you know, like an ostrich, put my head in the dirt and and not even come up for air anymore, you know. So, yeah, it was was one of those uh, 
high anxiety moments <laughs> during that yeah, time. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense actually. And I think that's I think that's something that you know, that nagging voice in our heads, and I'm sure we'll get into this more, but I mean that nagging as adults, you know, I always talk to people about this and it's like when you when you try something and you you know, you quote fail at it or you fuck it up somehow or it doesn't it doesn't produce the result that you want. There's no worse sort of condemnation than the, you know, how you judge your own self, right? Especially like so if you screw up, there's nothing that feels worse than saying than than using that that you know crappy result to confirm to use it as evidence to confirm what you already always believed about yourself man you know what i mean like so i sh- never should have tried i'm not good enough who what was i even thinking who am i to be doing something like this cuz you know so I, so but it's it's when you are in those moments when when things aren't going the way you want or things are challenging that you fucking need some people around you man to be able to to be able to talk through it and to help you rearrange your worldview and sometimes just to get the thoughts out of your own head you know and if you don't have that man that would make dealing with the the challenging times just exponentially more difficult yeah yeah and and you know a lot of adults in my community where I grew up grew up at you know they were working class people and stuff like that but they all had kind of a hard view on life and stuff like that. So um, I don't even know if their guidance would have even been useful or helpful for me because right. at the time they all kind of had the same stereotypical mentality. You know, you, you have to work. Uh, you, you you can't go far playing sports and you need to get a job. And all this, this whole mentality, you know, it's like it was just embedded in the culture. And I just didn't have a lot of real live mentors that I can count on, you know, during that time, almost every coach that I met um, that I had during that time were people that would, you know, curse you out and call you motherfuckers and tell you you ain't shit. If you don't play well, you don't want it. You're not serious and and all those things. So it it kills your confidence. I mean, it it absolutely crushes you or whatever, but I can, I can say this, like looking back in hindsight, um, even as a young kid, even without much confidence, even going through all the stuff that I did you know uh mentally i could honestly say that it was something inside of me it was this small nugget of saying like you can do something with yourself and you can do something with your life i don't know where it came from or how or where or what because like i said i had no mentors my mom and dad you know they loved me to death or whatever but they weren't around much you know so i didn't get much from them Uh, but there was this small nugget of something inside of me that was always telling me that you know i could get out and i think that's why eventually i I started taking sports so seriously, you know, because I wanted to do something to get myself out of my my situation. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm actually surprised to hear you say that uh, a lot of people are shitting on you for wanting to pursue sports. I would have thought that a lot of people would have seen that. I mean, despite the fact that the chances are of of making it in any type of professional situation are small, I would have thought people would have encouraged you as as you, looking at it as a way out. I mean, but think about this: like I wasn't around many. Uh, people that knew anything about sports. My grandma didn't know nothing about sports. Mm. My dad played uh, minor league baseball for, for a time, but like, you know, he didn't make it. So basically he, and I guess in his mind, he failed at it. So, you know, that's another person who's not going to think you can go far doing something like that. My mom knew nothing about sports. Um, Most of the men that were in the neighborhood, you know, that were baseball coaches and stuff like that, they were doing it just for fun, but they didn't see that as any type of, long-term way of making money and stuff like that because mm-hmm. you know like i said during that time most of the people had working 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 mind mentalities you know so that's what they wanted for you they wanted you to go to college and then eventually you know maybe go on and, and get a job but nobody's gonna push you to go out there and, and and try to take your craft serious in terms of sports or whatever to go on and eventually become a professional which is what some at you know uh, eventually that I, I wanted to do Okay, cool. So, yeah, that, I mean, that, I think that even shows – it's insightful to understanding your internal motivations, right? Because, I mean, you really had the fucking deck stacked against you, man. And it's yeah. it's fascinating. Oh, and to- I haven't given you the juicy stuff yet, but, yeah, yeah, I did have the deck stacked against me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, you know, but it's interesting that that that, that nugget – you mentioned, you know, that sort of that flame was never extinguished of believing that you could, 
you could uh, do something else. And I just find that fascinating because of where you came from and because of, yeah. you know, there's, there's people and we're all different. And it's not a question of comparing one person to another, but I mean, there's so many people that have dealt with so much less and that voice in their head is so fucking strong that says, you know, I'm never going to be able to make it. And, and so I, I find that, it, uh, it's just super interesting that, that, you know, again, that flame was never extinguished. So, um, so you're, Okay, so at this point you're playing basketball, you're getting good at it. So I mean, yeah. what so what happened? What happens next? So okay. I mean, eventually you turn professional here at some point. So how did that all play out? I'm just, as a guy who like I have to share my my basketball okay. experience yeah, with go you. Ahead. Okay, so <laughs> go ahead, I'm like a short short white guy. Okay? <laughs> okay, I am playing grade nine. So I remember when I was in grade nine, I played grade nine basketball. So I was on the uh, we had like. The great you were the, basically the grade nine basketball team was totally lame, right? I mean, you had the because you had the juniors and the seniors, but then you had the bantams, and this was just the grade nine. So we had yeah. six people on the team. So get this, I mean, six people on the team, and I still hardly ever played, man. Like we had the same five people out so, the whole game because I was so bad that I was worse than the most tired other grade nine. You know, so every once in a while the coach would put me in and I'd just throw up an air ball or two and he'd pull me out. And I, it was it was the worst thing ever, man. Oh my god, it was so shitty. So, anyways, that was that was basically when I knew there was no there was no flame inside of me telling me that. that Come on, just keep plugging away, man. You can make it. No, not so much. Right. Right. Okay, well, okay, well, what about this? What if I told you I didn't even make my grade nine team? I was cut from the team. Really? I didn't even make the team, man. Like, so, all right, to go back to my love for the game, having a love for the game doesn't mean you can actually play the game, right? So, right. <laughs> I yeah, love yeah. playing basketball more than playing baseball, but as good as I thought I, I, I might have improved and stuff, I wasn't that good. So, I wouldn't try it out for my high school team when I was in ninth grade. And the, the the grade nine team that, that you talk about uh, tried out for this team, and uh, I was cut. I mean, just flat out, I was cut. I wasn't good enough. I didn't make the team. All of my friends, all my buddies that I knew, uh, they all made the team and stuff. You know, so that that really crushed me. You know, mm-hmm, already not having a lot of confidence to begin with, and then going out for you know you know a, a ninth grade team and seeing all your buddies make the team and you eventually don't make the team. That even drove me even more into a, into a rut then. So, like, I, I lost a lot of confidence. You know, I cried. I was hurt. Um, I actually thought I should have made the team. You know, it was a couple of guys on the team that weren't as good as me, you know, but they did make the team. So, you know, I didn't make the team. So I went home, cried my butt off. And uh, my whole freshman year, um, just to avoid people and the shame and stuff like that of not making the team, or whatever, and just being this this kind of an outcast guy. Because without sports, you know, I didn't have a lot of personality and stuff. So I, I kind of needed it for my self-confidence at that time. So without that, you know, I was just a regular student, regular kid or whatever in, in high school as a freshman and stuff. And I wasn't that tall. I was only like five foot five, five, seven, five foot five as a freshman. And I'm uh, six, six now. But, I, you know, I eventually grew. But I was only five, five as a freshman. And so I, I got cut from that team and I started hanging out with one of my closest buddies, uh, this kid named Raymond Ward. Um, and every day we would go throughout our classes and stuff during the day. And to avoid the rush after school, because, you know, you got all this rush of kids and stuff. Once the bell rings, getting out, going in front of the school, jumping on buses or whatever, cars or whatever, get, getting ready to get home and get themselves out of there. And so to avoid the, the school traffic and to not be ridiculed and have to be around other kids and stuff, you know, after school on the bus, on the school bus. What my buddy Raymond and I would do, once the barrel rang, we would we would get out of our ninth period class and we would run, like literally run like a mile away from the school to another bus stop to jump on a bus to go home. That's how much of an introvert I was during that time. That's how little, little confidence that I had myself at the time. I didn't want to be around other kids. I was shamed, shamed, I was ashamed of myself and uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of personality. So this is what I did every day. Uh, a school for my full fr- for my whole freshman year. Now, not making a team did do something to me because I I really wanted to make that team. So that following summer, that next summer after my freshman year, I went to every playground that I possibly could in the neighborhood, played basketball every day, started working out, you know, uh, playing as much as I could or whatever, and you know, I eventually got a little bit better. So going back into my sophomore year, 
Uh, I, I tried out for the team and I eventually made the team. And, I, and, and, and it was a great, great feeling, you know, after going all, going through all what I had my freshman year, you know, going out for the sophomore team and making the team, it showed that if I put in a little bit of work, you know, things can work out. So now I'm starting to build up a little bit of a, a work ethic because I see like, okay, if I practice and actually put in some time, then maybe, maybe I can be kind of good at this thing. So, you know, I was five, seven as a sophomore, which isn't much taller, but I was a little bit taller. And, you know, uh, I made the team, played okay during my, my sophomore year, whatever. So between my f- sophomore and my junior year, I grew from 5'7 to 6'3. Wow. All right. So wow. what, that was a huge jump, like over the summer. That was a huge jump. So now as a basketball player, you know, you start getting girls that start to get into you and, and, and telling you how, you know, nice you look and they love how you play basketball or whatever. And for, for for a kid like me, you know, it felt good. You know, I like I like that feeling. You know, yeah. No but kidding. I was also, be, but I was also also did not knowing it being drawn into this thing of, of 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 reward, right? Like, so I play basketball, so I'm an athlete, so I get the reward of you know people acknowledging me and you know girls want to be into me and all that kind of deal. You know, like I got into that stuff. Like, so you know, you start to soak all that stuff up. Oh hell so, yeah. And, and, you know, if you're not careful, you can start feeling yourself. You know, I, I I try to be humble as much as I could, but you know, um, after being, I don't know, bashed on for so many years, man, you know, now comes a time where I can kind of be kind of the man, like you know, even if it's just you know high school basketball, or whatever. So I grew to six three, played really really well my junior year, my senior year I made like all city theme or whatever in the area, um, and I played well enough where I can get a scholarship, not so well where I could get a scholarship to any big Division one basketball school or whatever, but I was good enough to uh, uh, go to junior college. Mm-hmm. And so since I wasn't highly recruited, I went to JUCO in, in the Chicago area to South Suburban Junior College. Uh, that's in South Holland, Illinois, uh, you know, or Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago. Played a couple of years there. And during my uh, my sophomore year at South Suburban, I went out and tried for a junior college All-American basketball camp. And it's here where Murray State came out and, and, and started recruiting me at this basketball camp. So I played very, very well at the basketball camp, started getting college recruiting letters and stuff like that. And I eventually got a, a scholarship to go on to play uh, college basketball at Murray State University. Wow, what a! I mean, there's so much there. So when, I guess maybe taking that back a little bit, when you were, how did you? I mean, for again, for a guy who's been kind of you said like bashed on, you you, you don't make the, the the grade nine team. Where did you even like? What was going through your mind? to even try out for the sophomore team? Like you must've been shitting your pants when you were trying out, like, you know, being just terrified of failing and not making the team again. But how did you, you know, as an introverted guy who had to run to take another, you know, would run to take another school bus. Like how did you get the mojo, I guess, to even think about trying out for the sophomore team and making it might even be a possibility. I mean, like I said, man, some of this stuff, I, I don't give myself that much credit because, like I said, it, it was something in me, and I, I can't even put a finger on it, but it was something inside of me, and I just feel like it's my destiny really in this life and in, in this time that I'm on earth right now. I just feel like it was always something that was calling me, you know, and I can't really put my finger on it other than the fact that over the summer I put, I put in some work and I started getting a little bit of confidence because I started being better than the kids in my neighborhood at least. So I knew that I was getting better and stuff like that. So that gave me some confidence, at least enough confidence to go and try out again. And I felt like, you know, I'm now the guys that were better than me off my freshman year, you know, I'm kicking their butts and stuff over the summer. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm going out for the team my sophomore year and I'm going to make the team. So I was driven at least by that. And eventually, like I said, I stopped out playing those kids. And uh, uh, that's what that's what got me to do it. But where it came from, I, I can't even put a finger on it, Jason. I really couldn't tell you, man. It's just. I just knew it's something I always wanted to do. I, I got to love sports. I got a taste of it from playing baseball and stuff like that. So I knew the camaraderie that came with, you know, playing sports and being an athlete and stuff like that. So I really wanted to taste that again. And and maybe that was what drove me to to, to really want to go out and try again, you know? Hmm. So, I mean, when you're now – so now you're getting recruited. You must have felt like a badass, man. Like, I mean, Oh, my God. Oh, like you, you can't even imagine, man. Like – you at home with this woman, and and and, and I stayed home with my uh, grandma for my, you know, my my, my freshman and sophomore year of college. You know, I was only in junior college, so I, I was in an inner city JUCO. So I would go home in the evenings and stuff. Now I didn't at this age. I'm like, you know, seventeen, eighteen. So I wasn't going home much because I didn't want to be around this woman. I was old enough now, or you know, I could beat her up if I wanted to. I didn't have to listen to her and take her shit anymore. So it was like. I started to be a rebellious kid. I got some confidence from playing sports and stuff now. So now I really start being like a, 
a kind of a, a anal kid, you know mm. what I mean? Like I started being a real asshole, you know, to my grandma, to other adults and stuff around me. You know, I started kind of throwing, tossing my rate around because I had, a, I, I developed a bad attitude, you know, because you go from getting, like I say, trashed on for so many years. So now you like, you feel like you're in this position of power. So now you don't want to listen to authority. You know, you want to talk back now. You know, you have a bad attitude. You got all this anger and rage and stuff that's been built up from your, your from your youth and stuff. And now that you're a young adult, you know, you start to throw those those things around or whatever. So I did the junior college thing. And like I said, uh, eventually Murray State came on and, and recruited me or whatever. And that's how I got to, 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 to Murray State. So now what does that look like? Does that is that a are you there for three or four years? Only two, only two years, only two okay, years. I did two, two years of JUCO okay. with another coach who told me I wasn't going to be shit. Uh, he played professional basketball overseas and stuff. He, I think he did a short stint in the NBA and stuff like that. But he was a, another tyrant coach, like my grandma. You know, told me why the why the fuck are you in the gym? Get the hell out of the gym. You're never going to be good as me. I used to score fifty points in Europe, and you're never going to play oh my professional God. ball. Go home. You're not gonna be shit in life or whatever. Like, and I got this from you know somebody that's supposed to be a mentor in my life. Oh so, my like, I, like I said, at that time, I had very little uh, respect for authority and adults. You know, I, I I became a very very angry kid. And the thing about me, because I, I had this side where I was, you know, I could be real isolated and, and shy. I would I would hold a lot of stuff in, right? Like I would let a lot of stuff simmer, and I would tolerate and take it, and I would listen to it, and I would listen to it. But when things came out, they came out in a rage, right? Like I would curse people out. I'd be mad. I want to kick stuff and stuff like that. So that's where, you know, you start to develop the real mental issues and you don't know that it's happening to you, but it's happening live in real time, you know, and it happened because of all the things that I have gone through. A lot of the adults that I came into contact with during that time or whatever, it, it's, it just made me angry. And then I, when I eventually went on to Murray State, you know, my college coach was the same way. He was another reflection of my grandma and my junior college what coach. What the hell, man? <laughs> yeah, and you know, and but you know, the thing, like I said, um, Jason, like all this stuff starts with the mind and energy for me, man, because I've learned a lot of stuff about energy and vibration and the mind, and how it's all connected into how things manifest in the real world. And basically, from the time I was a very young kid, you know, this is the energy that I put out there because I'm, I viewed adults in this way. I saw people as, you know, uh, normal. I saw normal behavior as being like this. So everybody that I came into contact with from my youth onward, that's what, that's the energy that I put out there. So that's what I got in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, I got another reflection of my grandma. I got another reflection of my junior college coach and my college and, and my, and my uh, university coach. So it was the same mentality. It was the same person. It was the same people. But when you're that young and you're not in touch with yourself, you don't realize your energy is putting that out there. And so you're going to keep continuing getting more of the same. And that's what happened to me, man. You know, you know, I think that's so such an insightful thing because we do we we are active participants in the world in creating the world we live in. And I we don't believe that, though. We don't understand that. We think things are happening to us and things are not happening for us. And. When you put that kind of energy out there, well, guess what? That is exactly the kind of energy you're going to get back to you. And and I've seen it because I've seen myself transform my life now today compared to, you know, when I was younger or even, I, I say even just five years ago, you know, now that I've changed my mental state, my mind, my mindset, the way I think, the way I view other people, the the, the, the way I see my life, the, the, the type of life that I want for myself and stuff like that, I've attracted nothing but positive people into my life now, you know, whereas before... I was playing the victim. I was angry, you know, so I only attracted negative people into my life. So, yeah, we, we very much have a lot to play in, in, in the type of life and stuff that we live. You know? Well, you know, it's it's funny you say that because I remember when I was like, so when I was in the grips of being an alcoholic, you know, and I, it, yeah. it, it, I remember it, it's amazing how things like, like emotions like fear, if you let them sort of, you know, metastasize, I guess, how they can create exactly what you think you don't want. You know, like, yep. I mean, I'm drinking, yep. I'm, um, you know, I know I don't want to be doing this. I'm too fucking yep. scared to make any kind of change because I feel like the alternative might be worse. And, you know, what if I blah, blah, blah. Like, there's so much uncertainty about being sober. Like, as much as I hated drinking, 
at yeah. least it was familiar. And, yeah. and being the idea of being sober, I mean, what if I turned out to be a total fucking loser and I didn't have any friends and blah, blah, you know, all this stupid stuff. But And so this fear actually created – so when I, I created so much fear out of, of imagining how bad the unknown might be that I just kept drinking because it was easier. So I wanted to stop drinking, but letting fear – letting my, my, my thoughts and actions be guided by fear actually kept me doing the exact thing I said that I didn't want to do, which makes me wonder yeah. maybe if I just wanted – you know, I probably wanted to do it in the first place really because, right. you know, because I was just it, – it's just, it's just fucked up cycle – that when you're in the middle right. of it, you can't even see it, and you can't right. even. And it's and almost it's so familiar. It's yeah. so familiar. Yeah, it's so familiar. You know, and that's that's the thing. It becomes, like I said early on, like it becomes normal, habitual behavior, and you think that's kind of the way things are. That's the, kind of the way it is, or you even tell yourself, like, you know, that's the way I am. You know what I mean? You you start repeating these things, and again, that's the kind of stuff that's going to always show up and manifest in your life. Because I couldn't. I couldn't see for the life of me, you know, because I felt like I was an innocent kid and stuff. Like, why are these adults treating me this way? Like, this is so unfair and life is not fair. And this is bullshit and I hate life and, you know, people are, are full of shit and I can't trust anybody and blah, 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 blah. Like, you go on with this whole thing in your mind, this negative thinking, and you don't even understand that you're creating this whole vibe by, by your by your own thoughts, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. But we got a lot of, a lot more control than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, man, I totally agree. I totally agree. And that's why I want to do this podcast is because I, I want people to understand that you don't have to be, you know, you can take, you can take the wheel. You don't have to be a passenger. So, exactly. uh, man, I, I love that. So, okay. So you're now, so you graduate and how does, how does, how does somebody become a professional athlete? Like, how does that work? Huh? I didn't know shit about becoming a professional athlete. It's funny because in Chicago, like I said, I, I grew I grew up loving baseball, right? But Chicago's a basketball city. I uh -huh. mean, like we got some badasses coming out of Chicago in terms of basketball. You know, and you know a lot of NBA players, a lot of guys end up you know playing big time Division One basketball and going overseas and stuff like that. But I didn't follow basketball like that. You know, early on I didn't. You know, I say I started following basketball maybe when I was like, I mean, even when I started playing, I didn't start really watching it until I was like. 13, 14, I know 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, I was not watching basketball at all. I wasn't watching basketball. I mean, I played for fun and stuff because back then it was just, you know, you go out and play with your buddies and stuff and that was it. But I wasn't into the whole watching basketball and how do I become a pro and stuff like that because, like I told you, I, I didn't I didn't believe in myself enough to think that, you know, I could, I could eventually become professional. I know I wanted to play basketball for you know, being around the game and being around friends and stuff like that and having fun playing. So I know I wanted to do it for that. But in terms of becoming a pro, I knew nothing about becoming a professional basketball play, player. And I had no mentors. I had no people, you know, in my immediate circle that could help me to learn how to get to that level. You know what I mean? So while, while in JUCO, you know, you should start hearing little nuggets from people around you and stuff like, man, Twine, you know, you got an athletic body. You know, you tall, you've grown to be really like six six, you got, you know, a nice build and stuff now. Like, you know, you ever thought of become thought about becoming professional, you know, either for my teammates or, you know, uh I don't know. I had one or two guys that was pretty cool. Like matter of fact, I had a a, a mentor of mine. Dang, I can't think of his name. Anyway, I had a guy that kind of took me under his wing at uh when I was in JUCO at South Suburban. And uh, you know, I would go and spend time with him and his wife, and they were really nice people. It got me away from my grandma. It got me into a loving family environment, you know, because they were husband and wife, you know, they really loved each other. So I got to see a couple that actually loved each other and kissed each other and held each other and touched each other. I got to see that for the first time in my life because I, I didn't get a chance to really see that with my mom and dad because they weren't around. What was that like uh, to see that? Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. Like, literally, I'm talking about 18 years old, 18 year old kid for the first time is getting to see like two adults who are like really in love with each other, like madly in love with each other. That was kind of strange for me, but it felt good to see that. You know what I mean? And it it, it even gave me some hope and thinking like, wow, maybe one day like I can get married and, and have somebody like this, you know, for me in my life or whatever. So anyway, he took me under his wing and he started, you know, trying to get me in the gym and working me out. Actually, just but, whatever. Just quickly, I just want to jump in there because yeah. it's funny, you yeah, know, yeah. because we have – my kids have some – 
some friend, like some of their friends, and you know, obviously that some of them come from not the best homes, maybe broken homes, or maybe things aren't the best there. And not that yeah. they're not that they're horrible, but you know, and maybe their dads aren't as involved as they should be. And I always, I'm so conscious of when their friends come over. This has actually just happened last night. Like especially, especially like teenage girls, how if they don't have like maybe the strongest male role model in their life, how hungry they are for just to see and talk to an adult yeah. male who cares about them and is actually yeah, interested. Absolutely. You know, and I was talking to my daughter's uh, friend last night and um, you know, it's funny. We were talking about, we were talking about her. She had broken up with her boyfriend, like my, my daughter's friend. And we were talking about all that and what those emotions yeah. were like. And my, she was, her friend was so into this conversation because this is a conversation she's not ever going to have probably with her own dad. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. and my daughter, my daughter was like, Oh my God. Saying to me, she's like, Oh my God, would you stop being so awkward? But it, it's funny. I'm going to talk to her after a friend leaves and I'm going to, I'm going to say to her, yeah. you know, I, I totally understand why you find it's awkward that, you know, yeah. when I talk to your friends about this stuff, but dude, they need it, man. And I'm, I'm not going to fucking stop. Like, because yeah, they, yeah. it, I'm telling you. And so her friend was like, Basically, you know, my wife is putting on a so for my for uh, my daughter and her friends, my wife is putting on a cooking class, like a cooking camp this summer. So for five days, my my daughter and her friends are gonna they're gonna be here, and she's gonna teach them to cook some really cool meals and stuff like that. And then at the end, they're gonna make a meal for the parents. But um, my daughter's friend was saying last night, she goes, "I'm gonna be here. I want to be here every day in the summer, but, you know, because it's just it's so fun to be here, yeah. and just knowing that." That yeah. our example can provide that, yeah. like not only a, 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 a like a place where kids want to be, but like as you just said, like an ex, like an example of what might be possible for them is. Yeah. I I, yeah. I treat so that like that is so important to me that we model that behavior because it, I just feel like yeah. it's such a contribution to these kids. And it could be the smallest thing, like the smallest thing, like the smallest thing, like the kids they pick up on everything, man. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be some grandiose performance in front of the kids right. when they come around stuff like that it's just be yourself be normal show love you know be kind share be generous and stuff like that and when they see those type of behaviors or whatever they're gonna pick up on all those things man so yeah yeah absolutely awesome. that's great yeah all right so yeah, anyways you're around this uh your buddy's parents and uh yeah so I, I just his name just popped back into my head so gary townsend that's my man g if you're listening <laughs> gary townsend that's my man he took me under his wing so this is the first sign of a real live mentor in my life, right? So this is a guy. He was a younger guy at the time. I don't know. Gary at the time, must, I was 18, so he couldn't have been no older than uh, 20, between 25, 30 or whatever. But anyway, him and his wife were together, and I went to the house. They used to feed me or whatever. He used to come pick me up for practice, uh, take me to the gym, work me out, stuff like that. And he's the one who started putting in my mind, like, Twan, you know, you need to take this stuff serious, man. You got the body. You got the build. You got the athleticism, man. Like you could go on and, and get yourself a Division One scholarship, and who knows if you put in enough work, man, like you could pro become a professional, right? So this is the first time I get from anybody in my circle that you know that's telling me that you know I could actually go on to become a pro. So with that being said, I worked my butt off. You know, I started running miles and you know doing the push-ups and lifting weights and working on my body and you know going to the court and doing dribbling drills and shooting and all the stuff you got to do to improve or whatever. So I eventually got better and better and better. So when I went to a junior college All-American basketball camp, I played really, really well. And to go back to uh, your your previous uh, statement when you um, mentioned, uh, you know, what 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 that must have been like for for my grandma, man, those those college letters start piling in, coming into the house, man. And I can't tell you, like, I was proud of the, uh, I was a proud peacock at that at that time, man. Like, I was really feeling myself, man. Like. One letter after another, after another, after another, after another, start coming in. I start getting my mail and open it up. And yeah, this university, we'd love to have you come to our school, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I lost it, man. Like I became so, I, it was an inner arrogance. It wasn't an outer arrogance, right? Cause I was, like I said, I was a shy kid. So I, I never, I wasn't the gold chain guy and, you know, trying to show off. I wasn't that guy, but I had this kind of quiet cockiness about myself. So I started really feeling myself when I started getting recruited. And uh, I wasn't nice to my grandma at that time because I knew I can go on and, and get from under her wing then. So mm -hmm. it was like, screw you. I'm doing what I want to do. I started hanging out with my buddies. I was drinking like crazy, partying, 
staying out at night, late at night. I wouldn't come home or whatever because I already knew, like, in my mind, like, I'm leaving. I'm going to college, man. That's it for me or whatever. So to rewind all that, to bring that back, I, I got to give you this story that uh, I told my kids today, actually, for the first time. Because they knew I grew up in Chicago and they know Chicago was tough and all that stuff or whatever. But I never gave them this. I, I never gave them the real juicy stuff about my about my upbringing. Mm-hmm. So before I get get ready to go on to Murray State, um, my grandma gives me a wad of cash or whatever to start off to go to school, or whatever, for my first day of school. So the day before I leave to go to college, um, you know, I go out with my buddy, my boy, my buddy, Marcus Ward. He was a woman chaser, or whatever, and I was kind of like the tag along guy. I didn't have any game, no mouthpiece, none of that stuff. I was just a shy dude, tall, good looking, or whatever. So if I got any girls, they would have to come to me. It wasn't gonna be off of any of my efforts. So anyway, I'm hanging out with my buddy. He's at some chick's house or whatever, and you know, we were smashed drunk or whatever, because we were out drinking and stuff like that, partying. And uh it was the middle of the night, so it was like 1 32 in the morning. I know I gotta get up in the morning, like seven, uh, eight o'clock in the morning to, to hit the road to go to school. So I got all this cash in my pocket or whatever that my grandma had gave me, you know, because like I said, this time I started to be arrogant. I want to show I got a little money in my pocket or whatever, whatever. And I was going to go out and just have me a good time before leaving off to school. So my buddy's taking a long time. I'm sitting in the car. I didn't want to be bothered. He was in there. I don't know. I guess he must have been sleeping with some chick or whatever, whatever. And I I wasn't being a, a part of any of that. So I, I was already wasted. So I got in the car and I fell asleep in the car waiting on him. So I, I just got tired. I was like, shit, I need to go home, man. So I was like, I'm going to just get out and I'm either going to jump in a, on a bus or I'm going to catch the taxi home because I got I to gotta go. Man. I can't wait on my guy. So I jumped out of the car. Now, this is like 1.30, two, maybe maybe 2 o'clock in the morning in Chicago, inner city Chicago. So I already know from experience, like, this is kind of a bad idea. Mm-hmm. But I was so into, like, you know, thinking about my next move in terms of like, getting out and getting ready to go to school and stuff in the morning. It's like, I got I got to get the hell out of here. So I get out the car. I start walking or whatever. And uh, I'm half drunk and I'm walking down the street, no buses in sight, no taxis or nothing like that. Cause in the neighborhood where we were, you know, taxis didn't run frequently. So I started walking, man. I- I'm telling myself, well, I'm going to just walk until the bus comes. So I start walking down the street and as I'm walking, like parallel to me across the street, I see a guy walking in the opposite direction of myself. So I continue to walk or whatever. And he, you know, he was kind of a strange looking dude or whatever, whatever. He looked kind of, kind of shady or whatever. I, I you know, I d I didn't want to judge judge him or anything, but he did look kinda of, kinda of weird, right? So I walk past the guy, I continue to walk straight, and uh as we both get a little distance apart from one another, I turn back over my shoulder, because that's kind of the thing you do in Chicago. Like, you know, yeah, you yeah. see somebody shaded on the street or whatever, you gotta see like what's up with this guy. So I, I look back across the street and I don't see him anymore. So I turn all the way around, and when I turn all the way around, the guy's like behind me, right? He must have been maybe a block off or whatever, but he's now behind me walking in my direction. And so I start, my, you know, my heart started beating a little bit because, you know, that's not normal. Like, why is this guy walking in one direction? And now all of a sudden I'm walking this way. He's walking behind me now. So I continue to walk or whatever. I try to you know play it off like nothing's happening or whatever. So eventually I turn back around. As I turn around, the guy was probably like eight to ten feet away from me. He runs up on me. He got a gun. Oh, right? fuck. Yeah. He's like. Get your ass in the fucking alley. Like, come on, come on. Don't, don't, don't fucking look at me like that, right? So he he takes his gun, puts his gun to my back. And so he puts me into an alley or whatever uh, across the street. And so I walk in the alley or whatever. And now my heart is beating like a million miles What is miles going through your fucking like, head at this point? Man, like, like I was, like I said, I was half drunk, man. So yeah. like, I was like, I was totally fucked up. And I'm thinking like, I'm about to die. Like in my mind, I just know this is how it goes down in Chicago. Like I'm about to die. Like you fucking stupid. You shouldn't be out in the middle of the night walking around Chicago with a wad of cash like this, like you just a dumbass. So like I'm thinking in my mind, I'm about to die. So the guy gets his gun on my back and he was like, give me all your fucking money like that. Right. So, I, you know, I put my hands in the air to show that, you know, I wasn't trying to do anything. So I put both, both my hands in the air and um, I was like, go ahead, man. Like, take whatever you need to take, man. Just don't kill me. Just don't kill me. I kept saying, just don't kill me. Just don't kill me. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm about to die. So he goes in my pocket. He starts fumbling around, sitting around. And he eventually pulls out the water cash that my grandma gave me to go to college. So he takes all the money, right? And I'm so drunk. Um, I was like, man, please take whatever you want. Take, take whatever you want, man. Just just leave me some money to get on a bus like that. And I don't know what made me say that stupid shit, but I said it at that time or whatever. He was like, man, get the fuck out of here, man. I ain't giving you shit. Like, get your ass out of here. So he's like, go, 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 and don't turn around. So I start running, right, like straight, straight ahead. And I'm thinking as I'm starting to run, like, all right, he's going to shoot me in the fucking back and I'm dead, right? So I start running. And by 
the grace of God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, for, for whatever reason, the guy took the money and took off and he didn't shoot me. All right. So I, this, this is a, a, one of those shady situations that I find myself in that I avoided death at this time. Right. So I'm, my heart's beating a million miles per hour or whatever. And I was scared shitless or whatever. So I eventually go off to, to a pay phone and call my grandma and collect and tell her to come pick me up. So she, you know, I'm, I'm definitely terrified at this time. <laughs> like, yeah, like thinking like how much she's going to come down on me and talk shit or whatever. So you're probably more scared um, of your grandmother at this point than you yeah, are of the exactly, guy with the fucking gun. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm half drunk and shit. This is going to be her first time really like seeing me drunk as fuck like this or whatever. So like at that point, I didn't care. Like, cause I started developing a mentality where I just wasn't giving a shit about about a lot of shit other than sports at the time, right? So she came and eventually picked me up or whatever. And uh, she was like, what happened? I was like, man, I got robbed. This guy took all my money, blah, blah, blah. She was like, I told your dumb ass not to bring that money out in the fucking streets. I gave you the money for college. And like you said, she just gave it to me. She's like, she just really let me have it. Made me even feel lower and more fucked up than I already felt at the time. So, you know, I felt shitty, whatever. But eventually she took me home and she, uh, you know, got me... Uh, Got me to school or whatever. Then the next day, I had to take off to go to college, or whatever. But like that was a really shitty time because I, I go from such a fun time with my friend uh, Gary Townsend, who took me under his wing, and the time that I was spending with him and his wife, or whatever. That started to feel really, really good. And now I, I have to leave that. You know, I have to let that go and start to go off on my own. Eventually, to get ready for college and stuff like that. And the day before I actually take off for my, you know, my dream deal of uh, being a college basketball player, I actually fucking go and get robbed and shit. And then to boot, I get my grandma to just let me fucking have it like one night before. So when I arrived at Murray State campus that day, man, that next day, I felt a sense of relief. But I also felt very, very shitty, man, because it was now I'm in a new world on my own, you know, kind of expecting the same type of behavior from, you know, the new adults in my life and stuff like that with no money. And it was just a shitty feeling going off to college that day, man, like crazy. <laughs> wow, no kidding. So, so how do you get recruited in like in, as, to become a professional athlete? Like, how does that how does that process happen? Well, again, that was another one of those things I didn't know nothing about. You know, I was at Murray State to be there for two years, play college basketball, and yeah, okay, I said with my mouth that I wanted to be a pro, but I didn't know anything about how to go about doing that. Right, and NBA that was a distant dream in my mind. Like everybody says, they wants to go to the NBA, blah 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 blah, but in reality. I didn't believe I can go to the NBA, but I did think I was good enough to maybe play professional basketball, even though I didn't know anything about overseas. So I did my two years at Murray, uh, my junior year, because that was my first year at Murray. My junior year, I only did two years there. So my junior and senior year. So my junior year, uh, I ended up being like all new newcomer team. I played very, very well. My team was in first place. You know, we went to the title game, won the championship and all that stuff. So I had some great times, you know, uh, in terms of success on the basketball court. And then, uh, my senior year, me and my coach, we butted heads because he didn't like guys from Chicago and stuff like that. So he used to really give it to me, talk shit to me a lot. Say, you guys from Chicago are arrogant. Um, I'm not going to play your ass. You ain't shit. You ain't going You ain't gonna go far. You have a fucked up attitude, blah, blah, blah. And so I would try to get in the gym and work out and stuff like this because I knew I wanted to play pro ball. But, he, you know, he always catered to the guys from Memphis or whatever. He was a Southern guy, so he always catered to the guys from Memphis and those areas down in the south, but he didn't love. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't like the city guys. So me and my other buddy from Chicago, he used to always be on our asses about whatever, like anything, any and everything, or whatever. So I didn't like him. So that relationship soured my senior year because I would talk back, you know, and I would rebel. I wouldn't go to class. I spent a lot of time with my girlfriend. So he would berate me about the time that I spent with her. That was the reason why I didn't play well. Blah 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 blah. So this whole spiral of shitty shit that's been happening to me my whole life is happening again with this coach, and now it's just. I'm old enough now where I can actually talk back mm -hmm. to the, uh, you know, uh, authoritative figures or whatever. And we just didn't get along. So that soured my senior year. I ended up not playing a lot. Um, I don't know. I had some crazy stats for the type of playing time I was getting. I mean, I was playing 15 minutes a game. It got that bad. And I averaged like nine points and five rebounds. The five rebounds was the leading rebounder on the team at only 15 minutes a game. So that told you a little, little bit of my potential at least. You know, as a player and stuff, despite the fact that I was having a shitty relationship with the coach, um, I still knew in the back of my mind that I was good enough uh, to go on and play pro ball. So by the time my senior year is over, they bring all the seniors into this room and they say, well, um, do you guys want to be invited to this free agent camp? You know, because it's a chance for you guys to go on and become professionals if you if you would like to do that. 
So I signed up. I was like, hell yeah, like, you know, I definitely want to do this. So it was kind of something similar to junior college All-American basketball camp that, that I played in that I went to. It was something similar to that. And it was in uh, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. No, Dayton, Ohio. So I had to go there um, to try out. And it was a bunch of college, I mean, not college, um, a bunch of overseas coaches and stuff that was there, you know, that were there to recruit American players. And so I played in front, in front of the coaches for like uh, four or five days and played really well in that. And eventually, um, th- this one agent, you know, he, he wanted to work with me because he thought I had some potential to, you know, go on and have a pretty decent career overseas. So I exchanged numbers with him or whatever. And eventually, over the summer, that summer, uh, he called me. He was like, well, we have a job opportunity for you to go play basketball professionally in Finland. Would you like to do it? And I was like, fuck yeah. Like, I went back home to Chicago after my senior year. I was there with my grandma. Now I'm like, you know, 20 years old, about to be 21 years old. I'm thinking, like, I can't live here because I can't use the phone. You know, I can't use the car. Like, I'm treated like a kid at like 19, I mean, at 20, almost 21 years old. So I'm like, yes, any any chance I can get to get the hell out of here, I'm gone, man. So I eventually took the job to go um, and play uh, in Finland, and that was my first job overseas as a professional. Wow. That's cool. So, I mean, what is, what is, so now, but you're still carrying all this fucking baggage with you. Like, so you're, yeah. you're, you're a professional athlete, you know, you've made it, but you still got the same, you, you still got a lot of the same emotional thought patterns. And again, again, baggage. So how did that, I mean, how did that play out or how did that hinder you or how did that impact you as you move through your professional career? Or was it, or you know, was it a positive in some ways? I mean, for some things, it was a positive because I had a, a chip on my shoulder because so many people counted me out. Mm-hmm. Um, so it made me work even harder to, to be not, not only a pro, but a good pro. Because I could have went over there and kept getting, I don't know, because my first job, I didn't make much money, right? Because I didn't know anything about overseas basketball. So for me, to make 2100 bucks a month at that time was like, oh, yeah, I'm rich and shit. But in reality, you know, it was guys over there making 21000 a month, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, playing professional hoops. And uh, it's not NBA money or whatever, but you can live a, substantially better than you can, you know, working like a, a regular nine sure, to five. Yeah. Plus, you're in Europe, you get to experience Europe and all that stuff. So it was cool for me, you know. But my first gig, I didn't, I didn't get paid much money. It was twenty one hundred bucks for like seven months, so I didn't make a shitload of money, or whatever. But I did have a chip on my shoulder, and I wanted to show everybody that I deserve to be a professional, and I can go on and have a great career as a pro. So that first year in Finland, I mean. When I say I lived in a gym, like I lived in a gym, like I was already introverted. I didn't want to be around people. I didn't want to socialize like that. When I did, I had to be shitty drunk or fucked up to go out and hang out and stuff like that. I couldn't just be my normal self because, I, you know, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. So the only time I would kind of feel normal and going out is I, I would have to drink myself into a stupor. Right. Oh, man. So all I the know rest that story. Of my time when I, yeah. So all the rest of the time when I was by myself. You know, I would be in an apartment. I like to cook, so I would cook myself these really badass meals and stuff. You know, kind of nurture myself in a way. You know, kind of the treatment that I didn't get at home, I started doing for myself because now I had a little money to, you know, go out and buy the things that I wanted, things I like to eat and stuff like that. So I would cook. That would, that became a, a everyday ritual or, or whatever for me. And uh, I would go to the gym for like two hours, two and a half hours, sometimes three hours in the mornings to practice. I would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and do dribble drills and do dribble drills and lift weights and stuff like that. You know, I will go and practice with my team in the evenings. So to make a long story short, with all this crazy ass practice and stuff that I was doing, I saw like a, a crazy improvement in my game from the time I became a college senior to my first year professional. I, went, I mean, I went like I became a really skilled player and I, I, and, I and I played very, very well my, my first year overseas. I averaged like 31 points and like, I don't know, seven, eight rebounds or something wow. in Finland, you know, which wasn't a big time country for basketball. But any league you can go to and average 31 points a game, like you're doing something right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no kidding. Uh, I can't yeah. – I, I imagine – like what was the culture shock like, man? I, if I'm trying to think of a place that's the opposite of inner city <laughs> Chicago, it's probably fucking Finland. <laughs> it's definitely Finland. But here's the beginning of my transformation, right? And I didn't know it because that's exactly what the universe called for me. That's what the universe ordered for me because, like you said, coming from inner city Chicago, if I was going to really transform my life, and show all those people back home or whatever that I deserve to make it and I was going to make it. Well, guess what? That doesn't come without uh, some type of life transformation. But, I mean, it, it doesn't come without, without some, some bumps on the road, I, I, I would say. And so Finland for me was like, oh, shit. Like, I'm in a country where I don't know what the hell people are saying. 
The food is like looking weird. I don't know anything about their food. They don't got none of the stuff at the grocery store that I'm used to eating. That was complete shock, like complete shock. So I got close to one of my buddies, the American team, stuff like that. He had a Finnish girlfriend. He had been there for a year. He was a little bit older than, than me and stuff. So we hung out or whatever. And so to kind of fight my inner demons or whatever, I started trying to get into religion and I started picking up the Bible and stuff like that. And because I didn't want to go out, because I felt bad about drinking and about my life and stuff at that time, I said, shit, I'm going to just dive into this Bible, man. And I'm going to let that kind of be my my refuge for now or whatever, you know, since, you know, I'm so scared of being in a foreign country or whatever. And I just started reading my Bible, read my Bible, read my Bible, read my Bible. And I was really into it. And I eventually met another guy, another American that was on another team. His name is Johnny Robinson. His son's playing right now uh, in the NBA for the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. And we became really close friends and stuff. So you know, I met Johnny and his wife. He had like five kids at the time when I met him. So uh, this is the second time I got to see kind of a, a loving couple, uh, you know, together. And so I spent a lot of time with those guys at their home. And Johnny was very much into the Bible and religion and stuff like that. So we would study the Bible, whatever, together. I stopped drinking. I stopped having sex. I didn't have sex for like, I think after the first time, I think my first or second week I got there, I, I, I slept with a couple of girls or whatever, finished girls just to do it. You know, like I, it was like, it was whatever, like I, it was no feeling, no emotion. It was nothing. It was just to say, I, I slept with a foreign girl or whatever. So I did that when I first got there. How were you treated yeah, after there? that? So how, like when you got there, like, I mean, when, when you show up as an American basketball player, black guy in yeah. the, in the yeah. land of the you know, people as white as the driven snow. I mean, are you treated like uh, <laughs> yeah. some kind of oddity or like a celebrity or? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good and bad. Like, okay. So I say for the, for the males, the Finnish males, the people, the, the, the male guys in Finland, uh, they hated you. Right. 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 You were the enemy. You're this dark complexion dude coming from, you know, America who they don't know shit about or whatever. You're a threat to their women. Uh, you're an athlete. So, you know, their own insecurities come out or whatever because you're doing something that they don't, they don't do and they envy you because of that and stuff like that. So you got this whole racist vibe or whatever that's going on. I mean, it was a, it was a country that was full of skinheads and shit like that, man. So, like, I would walk down the streets, you know, because I didn't have a car. They didn't give me a car. So I had to cut public transportation. They gave me like a bus pass and all that stuff. So I, I, I would travel in the city. And when I would travel to go, to go to practices and stuff, you would see like groups of skinheads and stuff like really? throughout the city. Wow. Yeah. 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 And one of the older guys that had lived there for a lot of years, he was a naturalized American that lived there. His wife was Finnish. And uh, he would tell me like, Tuan, be careful, man. Like, I know you like being by yourself and stuff like that, but like, don't travel around too much um, by yourself, especially at night because. You know, I had to beat a, a few of these skinheads' asses, like a, a, a few groups of these guys. So, like, Greg Greg was, like, strong-ass fucking dude, country guy and shit, whatever. He had lived there. Like, he lived for the hustle, the tussle, and the, and the battle, and the fight, or whatever. So, like, for him, it was sport. But, like, I didn't want any parts of that because I was this shy guy inside. And even though I was a big, strong kid or whatever now, young adult, you know, I didn't want to get in any fights and stuff. So, that that's just who, who – that's, that's just who I was. That wasn't who I was, right? So, I would see the skinheads out. And, uh, you know, Greg had warned me about that. And one day I get, I get on a bus to go visit a friend, my, my teammate. And so I'm on a bus and I'm traveling. And just like Greg told me, I say a group of five, six skinheads, they get on the bus and I see them and they see me. I'm the only darkie on, on the bus, right? So like <laughs> they looking at me side eyed and I'm like, oh shit, here we go, man. And like all those feelings of me getting robbed in Chicago and, and the whole city vibe is starting to come back into my mind, starting to play in my mind again. Like, here we go. Like, I, I have to go through this shit again. So the guys get on the bus and they start to stare me down. And it's, I mean, it was, it was a nasty, visible stare down, right? So I'm like, oh, shit, okay, I got to get myself out of the situation. So I'm catching a bus and we take off and the bus stop. And the guys, they, they start like moving toward me, right? And I said, oh, shit, here we go. So one of the guys in the group, he takes his finger and, you know, he does, he points his finger at me and does the, 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 the you know, the, the, you know, how they like to point the gun at you type of shit. So he uses his fingers to go like, Psh, like he's shooting a gun at me. And I'm like, oh, fuck. So the next stop, the next bus stop, instead of me trying to get into a tussle or fight with these guys, I'm not trying to fight like five, six guys. I'm like, screw that. I might be down two or three of them, but I, I'm not going to be able to be down six guys. So the next bus stop. The bus stops. I jump off and I start walking, man. Like I just literally get off in a dead of winter in Finland, cold as fuck, you know, snow every damn where, dark or whatever. 
And just to avoid any type of confrontation or fight with these guys, man, I just get the hell off of the off of the off of the bus. So that was one experience or whatever. But like during my whole year that I was there in Finland, like you would get people, you know, calling you nigger or whatever in their language. You don't know that that's what they're saying, but they would call you nigger and stuff like that. They didn't like anybody of color in their country because they had a bunch of foreign refugees and stuff mm-hmm. that were there too. And so they got treated really bad or whatever. Now the women, on the other hand, that was totally different. Like the women saw you as this beautiful guy beautiful skin complexion coming from America and stuff like that. So they were all over you. Like they would mug you. Like they were literally like just jump on top of you. I mean, the girls that I, I, I had sexual relationships with when I was there, I didn't have to do shit. Like I was at the club wasted or whatever. And they came and they approached me. They put me in a taxi, paid for the taxi, took me to their crib. I would screw them. And that would be it. Like that was it. Like that's how <laughs> every went, young guy's like, dream seriously. come true, man. Yeah, like I had to do nothing. But like I said, like uh, I used to joke, you know, when I used to hang out with my buddy back home in Chicago, like I didn't have a mouthpiece, man. I was just a shy yeah. guy and stuff. Yeah, I was a handsome guy. I was strong, nice build, all this stuff or whatever. I could have easily gotten girls if I put some effort into it, but I just didn't care, you know. And so uh, any action I got during that time was definitely uh, um, not uh, on anything on my part or whatever. So, yeah, man, like uh, to go back to that, like. They didn't care for people of color in Finland, and yeah, but it was a real racist vibe there. So that was that was weird. Oh yeah, I <laughs> bet, weird. man, I bet. But again, it, it it's interesting how you know you're still running into some of the same issues, right? That you've you've yeah, really faced it's the same stuff. Yeah, same stuff. So same shit. So yeah. now you mentioned you. So you find the Bible. So I mean, how does how yeah. does your career progress? I guess. So I mean. Just I guess walk us through that. Like, how long did you play professional ball? Where'd you go? I know you live in France right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I played for 18 years. Wow. And you know, when I, when I first came over, I didn't think I would play 18 years, right? You don't go into that thinking like, oh, I'm living in a foreign country and I'm going to play professional ball 18 years. I mean, it's everybody's, it's every basketball player's a, a dream in America to go on and play the NBA. But like, frankly, everybody's not good enough to, and not everybody's equipped to stay that long in Europe or whatever. So when I originally left, I didn't think I would be in Europe that long. You know, I'm thinking in my mind, 10, 12 year, you know, window, and then I'll be done, come back home and I don't know, start doing design or something like that or whatever. So I, I, I didn't go over there with that type of plan. So I, once I finished my first year in Finland, I had played so well. I told you I started having like this inner arrogance about myself because, you know, I saw, I saw vast improvement in my game. So I thought I was good enough to play anywhere in Europe. And that wasn't the case. You know, I, I was good enough to dominate, you know, Little Finland and, and their small ass basketball culture there, you know, because it wasn't a, a big time country for basketball. Like the real juggernauts for basketball was Spain, you know, Italy, France. So I eventually wanted to get to those places, right? So, you know, my agent came back with a deal saying, like, you know, the team that you were with, they want to offer you three thousand to come back to them, you know, you know, give you a little bit of a pay raise or whatever, and they'll keep you for the whole year. I'm thinking like 3,000, man. I just averaged 31 points and seven or eight rebounds. Like, are you serious, man? Like, I don't want that shit. Like, I, you got to get me somewhere. Like, you got to get me to France or Spain or Italy, man. Like, I don't want that. And so because of my arrogance, I was I was given a, a, a real life smack in the face, right? So I go back home, go to summer. 2,100 is not much money. Like, you think that's a lot when you're <laughs> 20, 21 years old or whatever. But that, that's not shit. Like, I did a lot of partying when I came home or whatever. And when I got back to Chicago, you know, I, I bought myself a, a, a little vehicle or whatever. And eventually the money ran out like very quickly in the first couple of months when I'm home in the summer. And because I turned down a job in Finland, you know, I didn't really have a name like that. You know, I did well there, but like nobody in Europe really knows you from playing in Finland. That's not a country where you can kind of blow your name up. So I didn't get signed. And now everybody's starting to go back in August, you know, uh, end of July and August to play ball overseas. And I didn't have a job, man. Like I I was hit with a dose of reality. Like I had, like I had to get a job. Right. So I left Chicago. I eventually moved down to Atlanta. I, 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 you know, after playing professional ball for a year, I couldn't go back home to my grandma. Like that life for me was just like dead, dead. Like I I couldn't do it anymore. And, um, I was used to being on my own, having my own, you know, so I'm not about to go back home with somebody, you know, I can't, eat anything in the refrigerator you know she's trying to ask me for rent money but i can't use the phone i can't use the car i'm like nah the hell with this like i'm out i'm doing my own thing so i eventually left and went to atlanta and because i didn't get a um you know a a, a basketball job i ended up working a gig uh, with my buddy down there in atlanta for the summer we did summer camp or whatever and then that ended i still didn't have a job 
So now we're looking at like September, everybody's gone back and I'm still not working. So I had to get a, like a real job, not just a summer job. And uh, I eventually end up going to like a warehouse working, like printing shirts and shit, man. And I did that for like three or four months. And I, I, I still didn't have a, I didn't have a job. So November rolls around and uh, the agent, one of these agents calls me for a job in South America. He said like, yeah, they're looking for a, a, a number five player and it's for 5,000 a month, but it's only for, you know, three or four months. And at that time I was making, I think, uh, $8 an hour at that job. Like I was getting really shitty money. So like I was really smacked in the face, like going from my first experience overseas to now I'm back home or down in Atlanta working like a shitty job or whatever, not getting paid much. And I was, I was scraping for pennies with my, with my buddy at the time. I mean, literally like scraping for pennies out of a penny job to go to Kroger, put the damn pennies in a, in a penny mm-hmm. machine to get a, a coupon to go and get like a pack of chicken and shit. Like it was that bad, man. So when this guy came to me and was like, you know, they need a number five player in, uh, in South America. I almost took it, but I didn't take the job, right? Because I knew if I, I, I did, I'd be kind of like cheating the agent and the team or whatever. Because I know once I got there, they'd be looking for a big ass tall player and stuff. And, and I wasn't that guy. So I didn't take the job. And eventually I got another call uh, the end of November to go to France to, to replace a guy uh, for a, a, a small club team in the third division. It wasn't, you know, the level that I, you know, dreamed of going to. But at the time, like I said, I was, I was scraping for money. So I just wanted to get out. And, and try to get back overseas to redeem myself. So the job, again, it was another job for like 3000 a month, but this time it was for th- three months. So I figured, shit, 9000 bucks in three months compared to the money I was getting at that time. I was like, I'll go make the money and then I'll deal with the rest when I get back here. So I ended up, ended up quitting my job, going back overseas, and I arrived in France. Now, this one thing started really getting interesting. This is when kind of like my basketball career really changed for the better for me, all right? So I get to France. You got time to hear this, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, all right. So I get to France, and it's to replace a guy. Now, France has a pro A level, a pro B level, and then they have what's called uh, National 1. It was called National 2 at the time. So that's the third level, right? So first division, second division, third division. So I, when I arrived, I arrived in the third division, although I didn't know it was that low of a division when I got there. But I didn't give a damn because I was getting the money, you know, I was promised, and so that's all I cared about. I just wanted to go there, play well, and eventually try to get back on, all right, to find something stable. So I go to replace a guy for three months, and uh, it's a small club team or whatever, and um, I get there, and right off the plane, this is the kind of shit you got to deal with when you go play overseas basketball. A lot of people don't don't know about I, sh- I should write a book on uh, overseas basketball and, and, and some of the stuff that you go through because it's not all glam like people might think. But anyway, uh, I get over there. They take me to a, a, my apartment. I mean, Jason, like the apartment is this shitty apartment with cobwebs. Fucking toilet is old as crap. The bowl, it got rings around it. The kitchen is old as I don't know what, like this old French apartment, man, like with just like old deco in there, like the the, the wallpaper from, from 1945, man. Like it was just a creepy ass apartment, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling some anxiety just by going in. The apartment, like, what the hell have I got myself into? So any, anyway, I pack my bags up, you know, get into the apartment, try to get settled or whatever. And so right off the plane, I say probably, yeah, right off of the plane, I got a game, man. Like, I'm in no basketball shape. I had been working out a little bit while I was at, you know, in Atlanta or whatever, working and stuff. But there's only so much you can do when you work, you know, have, you know, throughout the day or whatever. And then you go to the gym for a couple of hours. You can't simulate a real actual game you know, working out or whatever. So I get over there to France and they asked me to play like right off of the plane. So I go and play my first game. And because the level wasn't so good, I managed to kind of wing it and get by. And I think my first game, I might've had like 25 points or something like that. So I played well and the team was really, really pleased and stuff. And so they were happy that, that I was the guy that was there um, to replace the player that they had. It was a guy that was from Russia and they had never had a, a American player in that club team because they, they never had the kind of money where they could pay to have an American player there. So I was their first American player. And, uh, you know, I was a real flamboyant player. You know, I did a lot of highlight stuff, could really jump. Mm. You know, I would dunk on people and do, like, these amazing plays and crossover dribbles and stuff like that. So, obviously, for them, that's something they never had, had get, gotten an opp- opportunity to, to see, like, live. So uh, they fell in love with me in just a matter of three months, and uh, I played great. I ended up averaging – I think I averaged like 25 points for the three months that I was there. I was one of the leading scorers in the league. And uh, when it came time for me to go, um, 
I was a bit down about it. But uh, the general manager came to me. He was like, hey, would you be willing to stay like for the rest of the season? I was like, well, yeah, like, but how? And it's like, well, you know, the guy that you came to replace, um, he, uh, he he caught a cancer from the country where he's from because he was from Russia and they had some kind of outbreak or something like that or whatever. And um, he had caught cancer, so he couldn't he couldn't finish the season. So he had to stop. So since he couldn't finish the season, I ended up staying that whole year with the team and played well. The team did well. And because of the success that I had, you know, you know for um, in replacing the guy, they offered me a contract to come back the next year. So I'm like, a, oh, I'm 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 on ten, man. I'm like, I'm I'm ecstatic. I finally got a, a gig where I can actually come back the next season, be settled in a team that I already know. I know the players and stuff like that in the country that I kind of want to be in. And maybe if I continue to play well, then maybe I could just move myself up to the first to the second division, you know, which is what I really wanted to do, you know. In, in the beginning so um i go back my next year play really really well was the leading scorer best player in the league make all-star game do all that good stuff the team finished well we played like we were like top five in the league whatever the team started paying me like four thousand a month you know like my money almost doubled from what i was making in finland so i was i was happy like at this time it was like 10 10 month contract so it was decent money for me you know like i said i wasn't rich or whatever but it, it beats working mm-hmm. a nine to five back home so I was there and I was in a foreign country. I eventually got them to give me a better car and stuff. And uh, uh, during my second year, that's when I uh, eventually met um, <laughs> my future wife, man. Yeah. Yep. So, and yeah. so did you did you love playing basketball? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. I, I absolutely did. Um, it was times when it got to be kind of a, a job strenuous because people make it not about the game itself, they make it about all the other stuff, like mm-hmm. the business stuff and having to win games. And, you know, for that team that I played for, you know, they were trying to move the team up to the second division and stuff like that. So they have expectations and stuff like that. So it, it wasn't basketball that I ever had a problem with. It was always the stuff like around basketball, having to deal with people that you know only around you because, you know, you, you know, this, you just basketball star in their minds and stuff like that. And, you know, it was it was that stuff that got under my skin or whatever. But I always love playing, man. Like it's it's something. Once I got you know once once I got to plan and, and and really get into it, it's something I loved. And it was kind of a a refuge from all the all the other shitty shit that was happening. Yeah. So so now you're you're you know playing professional basketball. You're building this great career, but you're still dragging around this shit from the past. I'm sure. So how is that? How is that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, on the outside to anybody looking, I'm sure you know, you've made it right. But I mean, how is this, how is this, how are these, yeah. you know, what you've learned, these experiences, these thought patterns and shit, how are they playing out in your life? Uh, in various ways. I mean, like I said, I became a, a, a crazy partier and stuff. The Bible thing didn't work out for me. I tried to do it when I was in Finland. Like I said, I went, uh, a, a time when I thought I was going to try to be abstinent, uh, you know, abstain from having sex and, you know, I'm going to be this real religious guy. And, you know, I started to judge myself and everything that I was doing, my behaviors or whatever. And, you know, I'm going a, I'm to a be a strict religious guy and I'm, a, I'm not going to have sex until I get married. And I'm going to have a perfect wife and blah, 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 blah. And that's going to kind of validate me and my life or whatever. And all this, you know, things I've gone through, I can wash all that stuff away, you know, through the blood of Jesus. And I got my Bible up, so I'm good or whatever. So I try to do that. And. For whatever reason, I had highs and lows, ups and downs. You know, it worked for a time. I felt like I was being a bit too extreme. And then, it, you know, I eventually got married and stuff. And, you know, I tried to bring the little teachings that I did know about the Bible into the marriage and stuff like that. But I never lived up to any of the stuff that, you know, the Bible tells you that you should be doing or whatever, whatever. You know, basically, I start having this kind of a social mask, mm. you know, like trying to be one way in front of people. But then I would go home and feel really like shitty about myself. And then... So, I don't know, you started feeling like kind of a hypocrite, so to speak. And so I felt like a hypocrite. So I eventually, you know, put the Bible down. And then I would go back and I would feel shitty again. And I would go to the club and party a little bit and then not. And then, you know, it was this whole up and down period that I went through. And I just became somebody. I didn't know who I was. I really didn't. Like, you know, I thought I was a basketball player, a basketball star. But I'm not a basketball player. I'm actually a person who plays basketball. But, you know, People tell you you're a basketball player, you're this, you're that, and you start putting all these, wearing around all these labels, and eventually, before you know it, you know, 
you lose yourself, you know, and I got married and I thought that would make me happy. And, you know, being in love and having kids and all this stuff is going to take me away from my shitty uh, upbringing, my shitty background or whatever. If I get married and have my own kids, I can start my own family and create an environment where I can kind of control the love that's being filtered and all that stuff, whatever. So, yeah, it it manifested uh, the mental health issues in a lot of different ways and different instances, you know, some in uh, feeling like I wasn't loved enough sometimes in my own relationships and then same with my kids and stuff like that. Sometimes I would feel kind of uh, isolated from not being with my family, for example, when I was overseas, you know, nobody called me, nobody checked on me to see, or, or asked me how, you know, how I was doing, how's my career going? Cause you know, in my mind, like I, you know, I've made it, I've done something nobody in my family's done. You know, the first person to go and play professional ball overseas, you know, I thought that was be something that, you know, people back home could be proud of. So, you know, I, when I lost touch back home with everybody, you know, I would feel isolated and, be depressed and down and stuff and like, you know, start questioning like, wow, do, you know, do, do these people really love me and do they care about me? And because I really, at that time, I really needed other people to validate me. You know, I was I couldn't be happy with just myself. You know, like I said, I always had to have a drink or, you know, or, or like in college, I had my girlfriend. So I had to have her to kind of validate me or whatever, since I was going through a shitty relationship with my coach and I had my one friend, when I, when I was at Murray State and then eventually I had a few friends or whatever when I got overseas or whatever. But then, you, you know, you start having people around you that you can't trust because, you know, they only around you because you play pro ball and stuff like this. So I have peaks and valleys, ups and downs, highs and lows, some good times, some really bad times, some depressing times. I did a lot of I had a lot of abusive behavior with the drinking and all. I had a lot of inner rage and stuff so that would act out and play out either on the court. I mean, I've kicked basketballs in the stands. You know, I've punched players before. Not a not a lot, but it's happened once or twice. You know, that's enough to say that something's wrong there. You know, it wasn't a repetitive behavior, but you know, I, it it was enough where I, eventually you kind of know in the back of your mind that you know something's not right. And uh, you know, I didn't mention the fact that you know I had gone through some troubles with a with a girl in Atlanta who I was dating at the time. You know, I ended up throwing her out and kicking her out of my apartment, or whatever, because she was trying to. Uh, impose herself with my life and I was telling her that I'm trying to play professional ball and she she I let her move in and oh man like I could talk I I I could literally write a book and talk to you for probably <laughs> eight to ten hours Jason seriously man about some of the shit I've gone through man because I'm not talking about all the traumatic shit because this is a lot of traumatic shit that's gone going on throughout all those periods I'm talking about from high school to JUCO to the time I became professional and then eventually get married yeah, no, uh, like it's been a lot of stuff man like coming home late from partying and drinking and fucking drunk on the road and about to crash your car. Like, just crazy stuff, man. Foolishness, man. So, yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's, been, a, it's been a trippy ride. One thing that's always been interesting to me, and I, I think is when you look at it, say, so if you look at a normal person's, like, like a normal person's career, typically how it goes is, you continually get better, right? I mean, you you learn more shit. You 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 know you develop more relationships. You add, learn how to add more value. You may move up the corporate ladder, like blah blah blah, all this kind of stuff. And but I mean, with a professional athlete, it's different, right? You have a very finite period of time where you're performing at your best. And we've all, you know, anybody who's watched sports or followed a team has always seen like you know the fucking people that just hang on just too long, man. You know, like and not maybe there's maybe there's no it's it's for them to i mean it's obviously for them to decide but i guess you know when you're looking at you know deriving like some of these these mental health issues and and you know emotionally driven responses to all these invalidating experiences you had and then you look at yourself who's deriving your sense of identity as you know not a guy who plays basketball but as a fucking basketball player and then as your career sort of starts to tail off towards, you know, towards maybe tail off, but you know, as you, as you get towards the end of your career and I'm sure you're not putting up the numbers you were in your prime, like how does that shit work in, uh, in your head? Uh, that's tough. That's a tough one. Um, uh, in my case, I mean, like I said, my first job, I, I'm, I'm making 2,200 a month, uh, or 2,100 a month, whatever it was. Um, you know, I eventually doubled that, got to 4,000 you know, around the time I was, I don't know, 24, 25 years old, you know, you get married and then eventually I got the French nationality in my case, you know, it's not the same story for everybody, but 
once I got the French nationality, my, my, my income tripled. So I go to a six figure contract where I was making like, you know, 10, 12,000 a month. And then you start living the lifestyle, you know, having a nice car, a nice home and all that stuff. And kids start coming and all that. So yeah, you start eventually moving up the ladder financially and stuff like that. But like you said, you know, towards the end, the money starts to come back down. You're not playing as well. You think you're a basketball player, but now you're starting to realize your body's starting to, you know, tell you that you're not a basketball player. You're just a human and, you know, whatever. And this, this is going to end. You start seeing the, the, the finality of, of everything. So when that starts happening, man, like a lot of stuff starts going through your mind because you act, that's a, that's one of the worst feelings for, for an athlete is that mm-hmm. you become a retiree at a very young age, right? Like usually mm-hmm. retirement happens at 65, 70 years old. And you're talking about somebody any, anywhere between, I don't know, for some guys, 32, 35. In my mm-hmm. case, I played longer, so I finished at like 39 years old. You know, but like 34, 35, guys are hanging them up. And you're still a young adult. And if you haven't managed your money well, especially, like I say, for overseas guys, not all the guys make a, make a killing financially. You know, I eventually got to a six-figure contract, but I, I could say mm-hmm. probably on average I made seven, 8000 a month on average, which is decent money. Like I said, it was better than just having a – a regular nine to five, nine to five, but that's not like NBA money where you can stack money and have a, a pension and money put away where you could be, you know, secure for one, once you're done. So when you start to realize that, you know, if you haven't done anything to mm-hmm. prepare for after, you can find yourself in a lot of shit, man, <laughs> which I found myself in, you know, and a lot of other athletes as well. A lot of my buddies and stuff went back home and had to hit the reset button because the money that they made, even the money that they put away, even if it was a nice little nest egg, two, three hundred thousand. Right. Uh, you can't live off of that for the rest of your life. So guys have to get domesticated and get back to domestic life and working and stuff. And a lot of guys don't have skills. You know, I, you know, I was eventually fortunate enough to go back to school before the end of my career and start studying graphic design. So I knew, I knew that was something that I wanted to do once I got done playing. But a lot of guys, they end up leaving school, not finishing their degree, not going back or whatever. And then they have to go back home and start over with a you know a few hundred thousand, maybe a few thousand dollars in their bank accounts. You know, after all the wild spending and stuff that you know some guys could do, and uh, that's a scary feeling, man. Like now you know that all the people that are around you are phony asses. Like they're not gonna be in your corner when you don't have the money, when you don't got the house, when you ain't on the court, when you ain't on TV anymore. Like the old those people, they all disappear, and now you're left to fan for yourself. And like I said, if you're not prepared for that, that's a kind of a scary place to be, mm-hmm. especially for someone like myself who didn't really trust myself like that. You know, you know, you got confidence issues. You got this whole uh, being independent for a number of years kind of issues. Now you got to go try to get back in a work environment and stuff like that. And you're used to living on your own, being on your own, you know, doing all these things on your own. And, uh, you know, life changes, man. And that that's a very, very scary place to find yourself especially as an overseas uh, professional athlete, because you don't make the NBA money and uh, you treat it like an NBA player, but you don't make the type of money. So, yeah, I bet. And what, I mean, what is it like for you as a, you know, for, I mean, I guess for a professional athlete, but you specifically, obviously like to, when the, when the cheers, like, do you get addicted to the, yeah, fuck, you must get addicted to like people cheering and shit for you. And all of a sudden, yeah, man, how could you? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in my case, man, because like I said, I got shitted on so much throughout my life, man, that I live, I live for the crowd. I live for the the hype. I live for that shit. Like, I live for it. And like I said, not outwardly, but in, inwardly, I loved it. Like, I loved it. I wasn't a flamboyant guy like that. You know, you got some guys that walk around, they they, they want to show you that they're driving a big car and a truck. I was never really into that shit or whatever. But in terms of basketball, the sport, and the love that I got from being a professional athlete, like I loved it. Like the crowd, the crowd coming, cheering for me, screaming your name, all that shit. Being on the court, making the big plays, showing all the emotion. Like I live for that. Like all the emotion that I didn't show, you know, away from the court, on the court. Like I was a, I was a badass man. Like a badass. Like I would scream, yell, all the emotion that will build up. I would get it all out when I played, man. And it becomes super, uh, incredibly addictive. And when the lights turn down. And the crowd goes away, man, and you left to fend for yourself on your own after it's all said and done. That's just a dark, dark, dark place to be, man. Like, it just happens in an instant at the snap of a finger. It's all over. 
and done. And it's like, wow, how do I get that rush? How do I get that feeling mm-hmm. again now wow. out here in what we like to call the real world? Um, that's that's tough, man. And a lot of guys go into depression. I know I've gone into depression myself. Actually, I went through a depression early on in my professional career. It stuck with me throughout my professional career and even got worse after I was done playing basketball, man. Yeah, I can imagine. You know what, man? I'm, you know what I'm thinking here. Actually, I gotta. I actually have to run. I didn't think we were gonna talk this long, but I think we should. Do you want to? Do you want to uh, record? Because I mean, we didn't get to. We haven't even gotten to the, the part like about how you're thinking today, which I think is super important. Would you be open to like doing a second part to this? Oh my god! Come on, Jason, man. Like, if you invite me twenty times, I'm gonna come back twenty times, man. Because, like I said, I got a lot of stuff to share, man. Like. You getting small nuggets of a, a large window of a, of a story of my life, man. Like, I got so much stuff to share, man. So absolutely, man. If you invite me back, I'll, I'll, de- I'll be more than happy to come back. Yeah, because I really, really want to talk to you about is how you've gone from, you know, from this this upbringing in the spot to the way you think today, which is really uh, pretty in line with the way I'm thinking. And I, I think it's a super powerful message. So I love that we set the table here, um, and then when we come back, we can uh, we can get right into all that kind of stuff because I think that you just have such an amazing message to share. Great, man. Great, great, great. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Just anytime you let me know and, and I'll be here. Yeah, we'll do it soon. Okay, let me uh, – well, so first of all, th- thanks – I mean, thank you, man. I, this conversation, I fucking love this. It's just uh, – <laughs> it's been great. So, yeah, let's uh, – we'll do a part – we'll call this part one. And then uh, after we stop recording here, let's set up a time to uh, record part two and uh, get into the get into the stuff that uh, I think uh, – Many, many people around the world need to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. So, yeah, I was stumbling and fumbling a little bit today, but I'll be better the next time. Man. It's, it's good. No, you did great, man. You did great. And there you have it. So I can see – I'm assuming you can see – uh, just by the ease, what an easy guy Antoine is to talk to, how we kind of ended up rambling on a little longer than I planned, much longer than I planned, but be that as it may, that happens sometimes. And I love long form conversations. They give just such an awesome chance to learn about one another. And it gives us a chance to continue in part two of this amazing conversation. So thanks, buddy. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you for reaching out to me and making, you know, asking how you could make a positive contribution in the, uh, you know, mental health space, I guess you could say. Um, You're a great guy and you got a lot to offer and I love talking to you, brother. So take care. Thanks for listening to the Emotionally Excellent Man Show. Now, go own your shit like the powerful, handsome boss man that you are.